Nomads 4. Foreign Worlds. By Alan J. Stark. Traveling to foreign lands gives us new eyes and new hearts. Sir Ion. Teacher and educator of Simna. The daughter of the great dragon. Dominic opened his eyes. It was not the first time he had looked at sterile, white walls when he awoke from unconsciousness. The last time was in the fleet hospital in San Francisco, after he had survived the destruction of the Zora and had been brought back to Earth. It was unlikely that he was back on his homeworld and could see the harbor bay with the Golden Gate Bridge if he pulled aside any curtains. Dominic continued to look around and realized that there were no curtains here at all, and no window that would have offered him a view. He woke up in a white, sterile room with no view outside. Dominic listened to the soft buzzing and beeping of medical equipment. He studied his bio-readings, which shone in jagged lines on a monitor located at the headboard next to his bed. His medical knowledge was enough to tell him that he had nothing to worry about. He strained to recall the events of the last few days. An undertaking that turned out to be more difficult than expected. Difficult, because he was barely able to distinguish the dream images that were still haunting his mind from the memories of the actual events. Images, smells and sensations formed a confused conglomerate of impressions that he was unable to categorize. The real and the surreal went hand in hand. The result of simple memories from childhood and youth and scenes set against the backdrop of fantastic, strange worlds. The comprehensible and the incomprehensible blended into a bizarre nightmare. Dominic was just beginning to organize his thoughts when the door opened and a young man came in. He was barely older than Dominic and had Asian features. He was obviously a doctor, as his white coat and the instruments in his belt and breast pocket suggested. It's good to see you well, he was pleased to say with a clear accent. My name is Tian Gao. I have been looking after you and your comrades over the past few days. It should make you happy to know that they are all in good health. He pulled a small handheld computer from the inside pocket of his coat and compared the data on it with the information on the monitor and the other devices. His relaxed expression did not reveal whether Dominic was somehow worried about his condition. Where are we staying? Dominic wanted to know. On the Nugo, explained Gao. A decommissioned Akata ship orbiting the world of Parima. Parima? Dominic hoped it was a paradise world or even the refuge that was still hidden by mysterious mists. The prospect of setting foot on a friendlier planet than Dostra was a pleasant one. But the doctor immediately dashed all hopes. The bleakest brown sphere in the whole galaxy, Gao remarked. Completely uninteresting. No natural resources, no fertile soil. There's nothing there that anyone would want. And that's why Parima is the safest place imaginable. How long have we been here? About a week, Tian Gao reported, adjusting a few buttons on the side. We put you all into a deep sleep and treated all your wounds. That's the usual method here. It saves us all time and trouble. Some of your people will need a few more days to fully recover. And don't worry. Their dark secrets are all still where they belong, and they're still uncovered. Dominic briefly considered what he could mean by that. He didn't know of any secrets that he should keep to himself. Or was there something he had forgotten and was in danger of unwittingly blurting it out? A joke, Goa reassured him before Dominic could ask what he had had in mind with his remark. But I've always been bad at making punch lines. And before you misunderstand me. Your comrades are fine. No kidding. Can I join them? The doctor thought for a few seconds before agreeing. Sure you can. But take it easy. You've done inhuman and human things. That's enough for the next few years. Dominic swung out of bed and would have fallen if Tian Goa hadn't held him down. Always slow down, the doctor warned. The suit you're in may stimulate your muscles, but it's not the same as walking around. You've been lying in bed for days. Your sense of balance needs to recalibrate. You will spend the next few days here in this monitoring ward. 
I want to rule out any risk. Dominic realized that he was wearing a gray outfit that hugged his body as tightly as the pressure suit he had worn a few times during his training. Stratospheric Flight Training Lesson Entry and Exit Maneuvers He had suffered from claustrophobia in that suit. And it was no different now. There was a display on his arm on which he could read his condition using accurate diagrams. His blood pressure and heart rate increased, but then the suit adapted to the challenges of standing and walking and stabilized his posture. The pressure seemed to ease and the feeling of being trapped disappeared. You're on the right track, said the doctor. Boulon Mestre is a philanthropist. Which isn't something you can say about Alicado. There's nothing wrong with the guy. Even if some say he has a quirk. With these words in mind, Dominic stepped out into a corridor, through the window of which he could see the brown planet the doctor had spoken of. The sun shone on a marbled surface dotted with sparse patches of white cloud that had formed over the deserts. Dominic stepped closer to the window and realized that the hospital complex was inside an Akato ship. He saw the flowing lines, grown structures that framed the view of the brown planet and encompassed the construction of the humans, like an angular foreign body. The doctor also stepped into the corridor and pointed to one end with a nod of his head. Back there is the common area. The canteen, actually. We still have a garden, but most of your friends don't seem to like plants very much. Dominic entered a large, bright room. The remaining soldiers, who called themselves tunnel rats, were sitting at the tables. They had gathered in small groups and were playing board, card, or holla games. Some were chatting or reading a book. Captain Donnie Longhill seemed to have been waiting for Dominic and rose abruptly from the table where he and his comrades were sitting. Ableton and Cleese were among them, eyeing Dominic skeptically. Longhill came limping closer and pulled Dominic into a corner of the room. What did you say to the Akato? I don't know what you mean, Dominic replied. He had a hunch what Longhill might mean, but he wasn't quite sure. They were in a place that could not be compared with a normal military hospital and were receiving the kind of treatment that only high-ranking officers received. There had to be a reason for this, and Long Hill suspected it had something to do with Porter. Normally we'd all be dead, said the captain, as if annoyed by this. Or on one of the hospital ships, where we'd have been patched up more badly than good. I know you whispered something to the horseheads. They were watching you. What could have been so important that we were given this special treatment? Dominic was irritated by the disappointment and annoyance that the captain was so clearly displaying. It couldn't be a death wish. He had shown himself to be too capable of suffering and persevering for that. Somehow, it seemed to be Dominic's closeness to one of the Akato leaders that worried him. I told the Akato I know Ulan Mestre, Dominic confessed. Long Hill looked at the young man with irritation. And they believed that. Dominic raised his shoulders. Looks like it. Don't fuck with me, boy. A wrinkle of anger appeared on Long Hill's forehead. What's your business with the prince? Speak up. Dominic didn't want to go into it. If they were still alive because Mestre had made a fool of him, Long Hill should be grateful. There was no reason to blame Dominic for that. What's this place all about? asked Dominic. You've obviously been awake longer than I have, and I'm sure you have some interesting information. It's only for the elite, explained the captain. For people who are made slaves or bodyguards. I mean slaves in the ancient sense. Creatures with great responsibility and authority. Someone their master would entrust with everything. Only without their own bank account. What's wrong with that? I can't say for sure yet, Wong Hill admitted. But I would have liked to stay out of the inner circles of the high aristocracy. The court is always a hotbed. I guess it will be no different among the horseheads. It's a terrain where I can't fight and don't want to fight. Do you also speak for your people? The captain didn't seem to have an answer to that. He started to reply, but swallowed it down before continuing with another topic in a whisper. 
I'm thinking about Betsy right now. Sarah, Dominic corrected abruptly and sharply. Okay. Sarah. Long Hill looked around at his soldiers. She's probably still there in the cave. But now it might as well be on the other side of the universe. And even if we fly around with the Akatos, they won't give us any of their ships. That's where our privileges will end. A slave remains a slave, no matter how great the position he is allowed to hold in his master's house. Prisoners remain prisoners, no matter how long the chains are that are put around their necks. We will never be anything else without. Sira. What makes them so sure? No, no. I've told you my side of the story. Now it's your turn. What's your secret? Dominic searched the captain's gaze for an emotion that could tell him how he might react to the revelation, which would certainly distance him even further from Sira. I saved Ulan Mastray's life when he was attacked by Kimon on Earth. Longhill seemed unmoved by these words, even though Dominic knew that the exact opposite was certainly the case. He gave me a uniform button with his crest on it. It led me first to Dostra and now here. He didn't mention that Davis's diamonds also played an important role. The captain fixed Dominic with a mixture of suppressed anger, surprise and admiration. But somehow it was getting too silly for Dominic to let Longhill pin him to the wall like that. If you're afraid, why don't you ask Henderson to bring you back to Dostra? I'm sure he'll be happy to listen to your request. Doc Warden is a good buddy of yours, I'm sure he'll be happy to issue you with a certificate suggesting. We are now beyond all human desires and possibilities, Longhill interrupted cryptically and finally let go of Dominic. After all, some of the snow cats were now approaching him. The secret subdivision of the tunnel rats. They were Stephanie Dormer, Kelman, Park and Gardner. Late riser, Stephanie greeted him with her usual sarcasm but with a cheerful undertone. The real adventure begins now. What about the others? Kelman reassured. Everyone's fine. No casualties. I've already been told. Where are they? If they're not in the rooms, Park explained, they'll be in the garden. There are others too, Gardner added. People from the alien worlds. People who have traveled around the galaxy. Really? Sounds exciting. But how would you know that? Just a guess, said Stephanie. They don't talk much. Pretty arrogant contemporaries. Think they're better than us. They're avoiding us and we're avoiding them now. What about Davis and Skorsky? She's got it worse. Stephanie grimaced sympathetically. They have a lot of therapy appointments. We don't see them very often. Park grinned broadly. And they look very different without their beards. I think that bothers them more than the broken arms and legs they've suffered. The garden was spanned by a huge dome that simulated a blue sky. Water flowed under the dome, jumping here and there as a waterfall over dark basalt rocks and collecting in small pools. Large ferns overshadowed the streams. There were meadows lined with dense bushes and tall trees. A pavilion rose in the center of the grounds, where a few people sat and were served by graceful robots. Luxurious service units of earthly production, the likes of which were only seen at state banquets and in the life documentaries of overextended rich people. Is this the refuge you hear so much about? joked Dominic. It would be enough for me, said Park, earning a contemptuous laugh from Stephanie. She sat down at the head of the small group. You have pretty low standards, she mocked, or very ordinary ones. Where's your respect for the sensual, the orgiastic? The rest of the snow cats had made themselves comfortable under the overhanging roof of the pavilion. They were happy to see Dominic safe and sound. Dominic enjoyed his time in the garden. It seemed an infinitely long time since he had last felt this relaxed. He sipped his cup contentedly. Whoever made the coffee for the patients on this ward could call themselves an artist, and Dominic felt like a king right now. 
The conversations he had with his friends were cheerful and irrelevant. There was no topic that could dampen the mood. It could have gone on like this forever if Longhill hadn't managed to plant concerns in his mind beforehand. Dominic looked thoughtfully over at the humans, not one of whom had come to them to ask about news from Old Earth. They avoided even looking in their direction. They also seemed to have little to say to each other. Dominic was tempted to go over and engage one of them in conversation. Forget it, remarked Stephanie, who had obviously noticed that Dominic kept looking over at the people. They're not talking to us. Stephanie's comment gave Dominic enough reason to try his luck. He already had a victim in mind. An older man with long, thinning hair. He was too fat to be a warrior in the Akato ranks. He looked more like a secretary and bureaucrat. He was engrossed in a book. A book made of paper, with a leather cover and Akato lettering on it. Dominic went to him under the eager gaze of his friends. May I sit with you? Dominic asked politely. The fat man looked Dominic over from head to toe and then returned to his reading. I suppose there's nothing I can do about it, is there? Dominic took this as a sign of approval and took a seat on one of the chairs around the round table. My name is Dominic Porter. The man refrained from giving his name. Dominic dared to try again. A few weeks ago, I was still on Earth. Still no response. The book must be very exciting. You've been in the service of Akato for a long time? My name is Arthur Brooks. He said this without looking at Dominic. I'm just informing you so as not to be entirely rude. That's all you're going to get from me. My friends have already told me that. Then why did you do it if the result had to be clear to you? Well, Dominic continued, I'm curious. And I refuse to accept that the only people who are at home on the civilized worlds of Akato turn out to be a bunch of bigoted assholes. The other did not react to the insult, and Dominic decided not to bother him any further. Don't have any illusions, said the fat man abruptly, turning a page in his book. It's better if you don't learn too much. Keep your nose out of Akato affairs. Askarun is no place for dreamers. Your curiosity will get the better of you. Chapter 2 The Nugo was stationary above Parima and thus accompanied the natural change from day to night. The dark surface of the planet could be seen in front of the ship's airlock. Lifeless and cold like the Earth's moon. According to the onboard chronometer, it was just before zero o'clock. Davis and Skorsky were sitting alone in the canteen playing chess when Dominic joined them. You're doing better than I was told, Dominic opened the conversation, earning scowls from the two men. At least I see a couple of new faces now. He stroked his chin to illustrate the loss of their beards. I'll pull your legs out again, grumbled Skorsky. Davis leaned over the board and made a move. Check, he commented. And mate. Dominic pulled up a chair and sat down next to the two of them. Do you know this place? I mean this station. Davis leaned back while Skorsky studied the chessboard and retraced the last moves of the game. He shook his head and grimly muttered a few curses under his breath. No, replied Davis. This is also new territory for us. But you've heard about it. About this military hospital for humans that the Akato run. Not that I know of. But the effort they're putting in here with us is amazing. We weren't used to that before. There are more strange people here, with a lot of secrets. Stupid monkeys. Skorsky punished Dominic with a stern look. Don't ruin it for yourself. I'm not talking about you. By now, he knew the man quite well and also his sometimes bizarre sense of humor. I'm talking about the silent ones who sit in the garden all day. That's why we're not even going there. He tapped his king so that he fell over. They'd better perch in the trees so you know you're dealing with baboons right away. You know these people, don't you? I mean from before. Davis nodded. 
That's the Amos du Royce. The friends of the king. Arwa, Skorsky added, and it didn't sound friendly. Dominic wanted to know more and hoped that Davis and Skorsky would be willing to reveal more information than just the name of the arrogant people. What are their jobs? Davis grinned broadly. I can't help you with that, he admitted, not at all unhappy about not being able to come up with answers. But you don't like the Arwa. Davis raised his shoulders and Skorsky merely grimaced as if he had just eaten something bad. You're transmitting orders, Davis explained. Orders that come directly from the prince. Or from one of his sons. Are they privy to secrets? Possibly. Very likely, Skorsky grumbled. Dominic shook his head. And that makes them so unfriendly? I rather think they have something to hide. Davis seemed to become thoughtful. Or did his expression mean that he was already aware of the reasons for the Arwa's reluctance? You're worried too, aren't you? Dominic's question was more of an encouragement to Davis to voice his suspicions, but he just shook his head. People who have reached the top always have reasons to keep quiet, he rebutted. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Maybe they just have information about juicy family matters and don't want to get caught in the crossfire if it comes to light. So it doesn't have to be anything serious. I don't suppose they know anything about the devil in the cellar of Mistray's palace either. Skorsky laughed to himself. The devil. Where does the word Askarun actually come from? The Arwa had said the word and Dominic hadn't asked what it meant. He wouldn't have got an answer anyway. He thought he had heard the word before, but he hadn't researched its meaning any further. Is this the palace or the homeworld of Mestre? Davis and Skorsky exchanged a few glances before Davis began to grin again. Ask Arun. This is our galaxy, he said. The Milky Way. It's an Aponi word and means something like vortex. It can also mean dance. But I don't know exactly. Ask Arun, Dominic repeated the word. He hadn't thought much about it before. It sounded mysterious and enticing. Like the name of a mythical land, full of hidden treasures and unfathomable magic. And as in any land where wealth was to be found, as well as the power that came with it, it was uncertain territory. Dreams of power and wealth were always the perfect breeding ground for enmity, even among friends. Were the Arwa immune to such sentiments? Or had they already built up structures and were strictly vigilant about not allowing unauthorized persons to gain insight? He thought of the earth, where people fought against each other. Groups that were prepared to kill each other or sacrifice themselves. Be it for some leader or a Kimon mummy that was believed to be the incarnation of a god, like the worshippers. Dominic reassured himself with the thought that the Arwa might be strange and arrogant, but ultimately they were under Ulan Mistre's command. And he would certainly make sure that no factions formed among the humans that would jeopardize the unity and fighting strength of his warriors. To all appearances, Davis did not consider the Arwa to be a danger either. And he had already had experience with them. At least he had met them before and was able to form an impression of them. An image that did not seem to worry him any further. Long Hill, however, was more suspicious. Judging by his last statements, he saw a danger in their current situation. Perhaps Davis felt the same way but didn't want to reveal his concerns. At least that would be similar to him. Should Dominic tell Davis that the Arwa had spat a few words at him after all? Words that said Dominic would soon lose his curiosity. That Askarun was no place for dreamers. And that he should keep his nose out of Akato affairs. That didn't sound like gossip from the royal court that could be ignored or smiled about. The words conveyed a blatant warning. Wasn't a warning somehow an act of benevolence, Dominic wondered? It just depends on how you say it, he pondered further. In retrospect, he wasn't quite sure how the Arwa had emphasized the words. I think I worry too much, Dominic pretended. I should be happy about our improved situation. What about the ship on Dostra? 
Davis asked abruptly. I don't know what you're talking about. Davis grinned again. That's good. Just shut up for once. Chapter 3 Tunnel rats and snow cats spent the next few days recovering and following the instructions of the medical team. Dominic tried to elicit some information from Tian Dao. But he only said that he had found his purpose on the Nugo and wasn't interested in anything that happened outside of it. At some point, Dominic gave up trying to find out anything about the new worlds from the people on the Nugo. He would soon get to know them and then form his own opinion. His friends seemed to have come to this conclusion before him, enjoying their time as best they could and not worrying too much. Only Longhill strolled glumly through the corridors and avoided saying hello to Dominic, let alone speaking to him. Ableton and Cleese, on the other hand, seemed less ill-tempered than their superior. They gave Dominic the impression that they were amused by their captain's worries. One last test, Tian Goa said after wishing Dominic a good morning and waking him from his sleep. A nurse had followed him, carrying a neatly folded, dark blue uniform in her arms and placing it on the seat of a chair. There was also a pair of high, black boots, which she placed under the chair. She then left, leaving patient and doctor alone. Dominic saw that the uniform was covered with golden lapels and green, tendril-like patterns. The blue of the fabric was of an unusual depth and shimmered like velvet. This is the uniform they will wear, informed the doctor. That's the standard in House Mestre. The Akato also wear these colors. Blue, gold, and green. The epaulets indicate that they are under the command of Zurak, Adano Mestre. One of the prince's sons. Dominic couldn't hide his irritation. I thought we were to report directly to the prince. In the broadest sense. Tian Goa asked Dominic to stand up, spread his arms out and walk on the spot. As he did so, he kept an eye on the values displayed as diagrams on the monitor above the bed. In the broadest sense, gasped Dominic. Don't speak, the doctor warned. Lord Ulan Mestre is not often with the fighting troops. He leaves the war against the Kimon to his sons. Zurak, Adano Mestre is the most capable of them all. How many sons does the prince have? Don't talk. Run faster now. He studied the numbers on his display and compared them with those on the monitor. 23 sons and 18 daughters. One main wife named Diana and ten concubines from different houses. Political marriages, Dominic reflected. Some customs were probably based on a universal law of nature. And then a few concubines. He has a few more children with them, but they are not counted. What a show-off, Dominic thought, and his thoughts about a universal law were only reinforced. A law that made moral concessions to the young civilizations before religion and culture forced the instinct into rigid forms. Despite their long history, the Akato seemed to have retained certain customs. In this respect, the culture of the horseheads was very similar to that of early humans, except that they had spaceships and beam weapons instead of clubs and hand axes. Everything's fine, the doctor said. I can release you from the ward now. The uniform fitted perfectly. It was perfectly tailored and meant that Dominic immediately adopted the right posture. It was always a strangely disconcerting effect, what uniforms could do to people. Dominic's self-confidence increased as he looked at his reflection in the mirror. He felt as if he had grown a considerable amount. He went into the recreation room, where the Yunja crew had already gathered. For the first time, all the survivors of Dostra seemed to be present and were not hanging around in the garden in the corridors of the station or undergoing treatment. Dominic estimated the assembled force at around 40 men, unless a few more soldiers arrived. He noticed that no one had any rank insignia. Nor did his uniform have any insignia to indicate his place in the military hierarchy. Apparently they had all been demoted and had thus become simple soldiers of House Mestre. Perhaps he could now pick a fight with Longhill if he came down on him from above again without having to reckon with any consequences. 
He was itching to challenge the former captain a little, to see how he dealt with the changed situation and how he reacted to a cheeky word. But why should he spoil the good mood now? The cards had been reshuffled and there would certainly be opportunities to compete with Longhill. The Snowcats were also all present and gathered around Davis, who was once again the center of attention and lecturing. Skorsky, who was standing a little to one side, had noticed Dominic and smiled at him in a friendly manner. What new information is there? Dominic asked the group. Nothing yet, Stephanie replied and sat down on the edge of a table. But it's obvious that we're getting away from here now. But you had such a lively conversation. We're wondering where it's going, explained Davis. So far, we only have guesses. The uniforms are those of House Mestre. But not those of the Prince. How do you know that? He was curious to hear the man's answer. I've already told the others. Davis glanced around. Everyone who has anything to do with the Akato knows all about it. Dominic would have liked to find out from Longhill whether this claim was true. He didn't believe that the captain and the tunnel rats had ever met a representative of the princely house. No matter. Let Davis continue to keep his secrets to himself. Dominic was not a little proud to be able to give them certainty about who they were being taken to. Even if no one could do anything with it at first. We're being put under one of his sons, Dominic said. Zurak, Adano Mestre. Kelman frowned. Why is that? I thought you were his buddy. Your coin doesn't seem to take anyone straight to their destination, Stephanie whispered. A few more detours and there won't be much left of the troop. He had to admit that her concerns could not be entirely dismissed. Even in the Akato Tower on Earth, he had assumed that he would be taken to Ulan Mestre immediately. Instead, he found himself on Dostra and almost died there. He and all those who had followed him full of hope. At least we're still alive, Dominic countered half-heartedly before turning to Davis. What do you know about the Mestre army? Davis answered without hesitation. The Mestres are the only ones who bother with us humans. The Mestres are also the ones who maintain their bases on Earth. Are there many houses among the Akatos, David Steinberg wanted to know. A lot, Davis replied. About ten important, large dynasties and then hundreds of smaller noble houses that are feudal to the houses. Sounds like the Dark Ages, Kelman interjected. I think it's romantic, Tina Bowers disagreed. It's not as sterile as the governments on Earth. Dominic and Davis exchanged a look that told them how wrong the young woman was. Dominic could only piece together a picture from what had happened so far, but Raymond Davis certainly had more extensive experience. We will all gain new impressions, Davis said evasively. Do you think we should form the Surak's bodyguard? asked Park. They probably won't send us to Dostra. Or to another one of these damned worlds. We've already sorted that out, growled Stephanie, who was visibly nervous. Have you seen such finely dressed toffs as us on Dostra? I certainly didn't get a parade uniform from Desmond. Park swallowed and averted his eyes. Stephanie's tense, irritable manner was obviously overwhelming him. All the more so because he had probably had his eye on her. There was also a fear in his voice that they might soon find themselves back on some barren planet, fighting skelks in dark caves. Dominic suspected that it would remain their task to continue fighting against the Snoopers. But no longer on a world that belonged to the penal colonies, like Dostra. He couldn't imagine a nobleman hanging around on a barren rocky outcrop protecting conveyor systems. At least he hadn't seen any Akato on Dostra who gave him the impression of belonging to a ruling dynasty. But the Snowcats had probably already discussed this before. Do you know Zurak? Dominic wanted to know from Davis. For a moment, he seemed unsure how to answer. Nobody really knows Zurak, he finally replied. I didn't ask that. Have you ever met him before? Dominic looked over at Skorsky, who was staring at him with an expressionless expression. 
Perhaps there was a little fear in his gaze. Dominic thought he recognized it in his eyes the longer they looked at each other. Yes, Davis replied. But that was only fleeting. Dominic was content with that for the time being. It was not beneficial to clarify these issues now. It would only make things more complicated. Dominic put together all the facts he had already found out and wondered what had prompted Davis and Skorsky to retreat to the abandoned hotel in the mountains. It was certainly not just a pretended disappointment with the state of affairs in the galaxy and the sad fate of humanity. There may have been a disagreement with Zurak, for whom they had apparently been working until then. The more Dominic thought about Davis and Skorsky, the more questions came to his mind. Their secrecy didn't exactly inspire confidence in their motives. Suddenly there was a commotion in the troop and although Longhill no longer had an official rank, he barked an order across the hall. Attention! Officer present! He took a stance and almost simultaneously the tunnel rats and snowcats followed his example. Dominic clicked his heels together, put his hand to his temple and looked for the officer in question. It was an Akato in a blue uniform, decorated with lots of gold and medals that jingled with his every step. A long braided mane hung from his head, in which golden threads and pearls were woven. He was flanked by two soldiers in light armor made of reddish wood, who eyed their future human comrades grimly. The battery officer stopped and crossed his arms behind his back. I am Murak Maduru, he began. I command the heavy cruiser Jaber and am subordinate to Zurak Mestre. The firstborn of our Lord Ulan Mestre. Ruler of Otrokin. He paused and let his eyes wander over the people still standing in front of him. Your stay on the Nugo is over. Follow me now, soldiers of House Mestre. The wall of the room opened up and slid apart on both sides. Behind it, the part of the hangar became visible, with the starry sky in front of the airlock. Inside was an Akato ship, which at first glance looked like a huge, rotten branch resting on short branches that acted as landing legs. Under the raised bow, a ramp opened up, leading into the interior. Murak Maduru led the troops inside the ship and hurried through a corridor that penetrated it like a main artery. In a hall whose ceiling was supported by vaulted ribs, he instructed them to take a seat on the armchairs that filled the room, row upon row. Dominic sat down at the edge and could see out through the tall, narrow windows. He could make out the angular structures of the hospital complex, which merged into the flowing shapes of the Nugo like alien bodies. The Akato thought it appropriate to say a few words to the humans. You will be part of the Kara fleet and assigned to the flagship Jadaira. Your immediate superior will be one of the Daris. He is from Earth and will instruct you in everything you need to know so as not to incur the Lord's displeasure. With that, he turned around and disappeared into the corridor with his bodyguard. The engines were ignited while Dominic was still thinking about the term Daris. He assumed that the Akato meant the arrogant Earthlings. Dominic felt the ship lift off the ground and swing around. The gravity dampers pressed him into the seat as the vehicle accelerated and flew out of the hangar and into space. Chapter 4 The ship came out of hyperspace after a good hour. It flew a wide curve around the formation of the Kara fleet, which was hovering close to a blue world in close formation through space. At its center was a massive cruiser, its rounded shape reminiscent of a piece of driftwood. That had to be the Jadaira. Dominic saw the many lights that covered the ship in a regular pattern, marking the course of the decks. The hangar of the Jadaira was also huge and offered space for a whole armada of combat machines. The sight was breathtaking. None of the humans were able to utter a single word after they had left the feeder and followed Maduru at a run to the other end of the hangar. A troop of heavily armed Akato trotted past with thundering boots. Another tree trunk hovered above the heads of the people, covered with booms that looked like sponge mushrooms. A few smaller branches whizzed past and chased out into space. Armored vehicles with heavy caterpillar tracks rolled into waiting ferries that looked like hippos with open mouths. Even more impressive than the scenario was the deafening noise that filled the hangar as the people passed through. Silence settled comfortably on their ears as they entered a corridor and the bulkhead closed behind them. 
Further corridors branched off to the left and right, apparently leading to the crew quarters. They walked through the ship for some time until Maduro finally brought them to the bridge. It was large and all the equipment was designed to fit the Akato's hands and body size. The crew did not allow themselves to be disturbed in their work and did not even notice the arrival of the humans, who lined up in neat rows. As always, the snow cats formed a group within the tunnel rats and stood together in the fourth or fifth row. Longhill and his officers positioned themselves at the very front of the formation. Maduro assumed his stance, saluted and said something in the Akata language. He turned his attention to the human. His Highness. Zurak Adano Mestre. Then one of the horse-headed creatures that had been standing in front of the wide window with its back turned to them. The large Akato was dressed in a splendid blue uniform on which many colorful gemstones sparkled. The intricate vine pattern, which adorned every uniform of the House of Mestre, was embroidered with gold thread and thus emphasized. At his side walked a man who was also dressed in an ornate uniform, only the silver outweighed the gold. Dominic winced as he approached with Zurak Mestre and recognized him. It was the taciturn man from the garden who had at least deigned to tell him his name. Arthur Brooks. He had already spotted Dominic and was clearly enjoying studying the irritation on his face. He smiled coldly, and after his commander had stopped to take a closer look at the humans, he took another step towards the troop. At a wave from the human, Murak Maduru and his soldiers moved away. I'm Serwan Arthur Brooks, the Akato Admiral's adjutant introduced himself. The Akato call me Daris. A title that is applied to many people who serve the Akato. They also call me Jurgen. It is better for you if you never find out the meaning of this name. The best way to do this is to follow all my instructions without hesitation and ask no questions. This is standard procedure among the Akato and will prevent complications or delays, which is very important to Admiral Zurak Mestre. I do not wish any of you to find out how much importance he places on it. So forget the naughty dances you've been doing with your human superiors. As of today, you are nothing more than one-legged men in an ass-kicking contest. Dominic risked a glance out of the corner of his eye at Davis and Skorsky, between whom he was standing, to see if he could see any reaction in them. But the two men showed no sign of emotion. The man seemed unfamiliar to them and they to him. Your task, Arthur Brooks continued, will be to stay at the side of the Akato officers when it comes to battle. Your skills alone do not qualify you for this service. They have shown exceptional courage and skill and survived in a hopeless situation. Among the Akato, this is considered a blessing from the gods. And our horse-headed comrades are convinced that they can be the beneficiaries of this blessing if they have you with them. They are lucky charms. He earned restrained laughter, which caused Zurak Mestre to frown. You will then be dressed for combat and given your weapons, the Serwan continued. You will rarely come into contact with the heavy armor you used on Dostra. The standard armor is designed for mobility and to help you react quickly to any attack. Your protector is the Admiral. He paused. You're wondering how the Admiral could possibly put himself in danger when his position allows him to stay out of any mess they have to get into and watch everything from his elevated position? Brooks spread his arms and put on a questioning face before clasping his hands behind his back. That's because the Akata leaders always throw themselves into the thick of the action. You'll be right on their heels, fighting through blood, guts and shit with them, making sure not a hair on the admiral's head is harmed. That was exactly what Dominic had imagined when he used the prince's coin. Stephanie was right. Before he could find his way into paradise through the gold coin, he would have to go through hell in a roundabout way. And his friends with him. Finally, Zurak Mestre thought it appropriate to address his new bodyguard. I am proud to have you by my side, he began in a broad, throaty accent. You are the blessed ones in a world doomed to destruction. The will of Otain has brought you to me. Together we will fathom his will and become aware of the fate he has determined for you. Big words for all the disasters and hardships they would have to endure in the near future. 
Dominic involuntarily wondered what had become of the bodyguard that had served Mestre so far. Anyone who has served me well, the Akato continued, has the privilege of seeing the refuge and living there. At last, Dominic thought to himself. At last there was something concrete about the refuge. The words of a high-ranking nobleman, from the most influential house in Askaroon, and not just conjecture and dreams from exhausted humans. Stephanie and the other snowcats exchanged glances. The young woman smiled. It was rare that she smiled, and she looked relieved, as if every doubt that had plagued her until now had been removed. But first, Zurak Mestre continued, we will fight. Together. Against the Kimon. We will be comrades in arms. More than that. Brothers. My glory will be yours. And yours will be mine. Dominic couldn't help himself. He hated empty phrases, but the words touched him. Was it because the certainty of refuge still resonated in his heart? Had the promise of paradise just robbed him of his sanity and made him susceptible to empty words? We will fight and win. The Akato raised his big fist in the air. Win! Victory, the people shouted and responded with the same gesture. Zurak roared again. Victory! Victory! Dominic was amazed at how much he was carried away by the enthusiasm. Absurdly, he wished the battle against the Kimon would begin immediately. A fever rose in him, as usually only happened during battle. His heart began to pound as the voices of Okado and his new warriors echoed through the bridge. Win! Win! Dominic risked a glance to either side and saw how half-heartedly Davis and Skorsky were participating in this attunement ritual. They raised their fists in silence, but their faces were strangely expressionless. The expressions on the faces of the two men betrayed indifference or skepticism. What is it? asked Skorsky, who was standing right next to him. I'm just wondering why you're so composed. Why not? I'm just saying that this is the first time we've heard anything concrete about the refuge, said Dominic. And that makes you forget the shit that Serwan said before? That was indeed the case, Dominic thought. Yes. I'd be prepared to crawl through any shit for that. Skorsky grinned broadly, but Davis obviously didn't like this boldness at all if you don't take on too much. You don't know how high that shit can pile up. It can't get any worse than on Dostra, Dominic replied. Let's hope so. The admiral turned away to return to the duties of his command. Arthur Brooks beckoned to two young men who were dressed in the same kind of uniform as he was, except that there was less silver sparkle on them. Miron Sokov and Norman Bronstein, he introduced the two. They are my assistants and will take you to your accommodations. Rest for the night. In a few hours you will be fitted for your combat fatigues. You will then receive a short briefing on your duties and priorities. Miron Sokov, the taller of the two assistants, a lean man of about twenty-five, addressed the soldiers. Follow me. I will take you to your quarters. The area where the earthlings were to be housed was located on the deck directly below the bridge. Here, too, the equipment and installations for the humans seemed out of place, like foreign objects. In addition to the power and water supply machines, the rows of living containers were particularly eye-catching. Each container offers space for six men, explained Sokov. They can move into their shared apartments however they like. The Akato have no moral rules and we won't impose any rules on them either. Stephanie gave Dominic a gentle shove. Clear the way for us. Dominic earned a grumpy look from Steve Park. Would be good if we put the girls up together. I don't see any girls here, Stephanie said sharply. And if we did, we could certainly put them in with you. Dominic was uncomfortable with the way Stephanie expressed herself to Stephen Park. She had to know how Park felt about her, but she was probably enjoying punishing him with contempt. A trait of her nature that Dominic didn't like, although he could have been flattered that she at least showed him sympathy. She was attractive and had a strong character, which Dominic liked very much. 
We could also take Davis and Scorsick with us, she continued, before Dominic could express his opinion. Davis waved her off. Old people like to keep to themselves. Or he's afraid he might talk in his sleep, Dominic added in his mind. Chapter 5 Serwan Brooks retired to his quarters at the rear of the bridge, undid the top buttons of his uniform and sat down on his bed. The room was tailored to the human occupant. The light was bright, the colors friendly and designed for optimal comfort. Quite different from the oppressive surroundings inside the wooden ship, which exuded the charm of a musty tree cave. Gloomy, dark and always somehow damp, like a stalactite grotto. In his mind, he went back over the speech he had just given in an attempt to intimidate the new bodyguards. It had been his first speech of this kind and he had stolen the individual parts from the words of his predecessors, whose adjutant he was. Like many Serwins, Brooks had been with the Akato for a long time. From the beginning of the invasion, in fact, when the first human ships had been collateral damage in the Kiman Akato conflict. The first Serwan came from the Olympus. A colonial ship on its way to Mars, which was hit by a stray volley from the cannons of an Akato cruiser when two fleets were fighting over the Red Planet. More out of curiosity than kindness, the Akatos had rescued the survivors. As the passengers of the Olympus were members of so-called high society, the Akato commander, who was partly responsible for the disaster, found it useful to use them for his own purposes. In addition, for some unknown reason, Ulan Mestre, the ruler of the Horseheads, was interested in and enthusiastic about the humans. Brooks took off his boots, lay down on the bed and stared thoughtfully at the ceiling. He remembered exactly how he sucked the last liters of stale air into his lungs, enclosed in his spacesuit, how his vision blurred and a squad of Akato came towards him in the foggy corridor. In the vacuum, he couldn't hear the thudding of their boots, but he could hear the vibrations running through the floor as the horses' heads approached. In the end, the thousand or so survivors found themselves on the ski trough. The flagship of the Akato Prince Ulan Mestre, who divided the former passengers of the Olympus into groups and sent them to his sons. Until two years ago, Brooks had served in the palace on Otrokin and in Ulan Mestre's fleet. The chief Serwan there had been Yuri Barinsky, to whom he had been an assistant until Brooks was placed under Zurak Mestre. Here he had to come to terms with Serwan Victor Mears, whose successor he was to take over and who was considered stubborn and difficult. Qualities that didn't win him many friends, but for which Brooks has since forgiven him. There were plenty of reasons that could embitter a man and darken his soul. Looking back, Brooks was now much kinder to the old man, now dead and buried under the great tree in the palace garden on Otrokin. He had not known him for long just three months before he died. Brooks was frightened by the idea of becoming embittered by the many secrets he shared and would have to share with the Akatos. He wondered how much the burden of that knowledge might weigh him down and cripple him. The galaxy was not a peaceful place, and all Mestre cared about was the possibility of finding new methods and soldiers for warfare. At that moment, a chime sounded from the door, announcing a visitor. Come in, Brooke ordered and the door slid aside. Sokov and Bronstein stepped into the room. They stopped at the door while Brooks stood up and sat down in the chair in front of the holoconsole. What is your impression? he asked the two young men. Bronstein was the first to reply. They're very relaxed. And no one has asked any questions. What should they ask? Where are the soldiers to replace them? What would you have answered, Bronstein? The young man hesitated for a moment. That they've been transferred. They are now serving on another ship. Which ship? We don't know that, he replied, licking his lips deliberately. He's excited, Brooks realized. He senses the bigger lie behind the smaller ones and tries to muster the willingness to accept the grim truth they are meant to hide. Only I know where they are now, said Brooks and no one will dare ask me. Sokov's gaze wandered restlessly around the room. Are the rumors true? Brooks fixed Sokov with a long and penetrating stare. The two aides had previously been Victor Mir's assistants. Brooks had to rely on guesses as to what the old man had confided in them if he deigned to talk to them at all. 
What did Ser Juan tell Mears? Brooks asked abruptly. Nothing. He was very secretive, Bronstein replied. An excellent quality for a Ser Juan. But he often had nightmares, added Sokov. He would call us and sometimes he was still talking and hadn't quite come out of his dreams. He would sit there on the edge of the bed and hold his hands to his temples. What did he say? Brooks inquired further. The two assistants looked at each other before Sokov continued with his explanations. It was mostly just stammering. Hard to understand. But every now and then he would say something about mutilations and that they were still there. They're still there. They're still there. Sokov was visibly shaken by the memories. At least I think I understood that. Brooks waved him off. An old, confused man. He was already old on board the Olympus. He shouldn't even have been on board. So the rumors aren't true? Bronstein probed further. What kind of rumors? From the guardsmen and the Gothrex. Brooks shook his head. We don't want nonsense to spread among them. Please hold back with your conspiracy stories. That's the reason why we have no contact with the soldiers. Let them think you're conceited and arrogant. It's better than the Akatos finding out that you're undermining the warriors' fighting strength with your stories. Now get out of here. The two young men bowed and left the Serwin's quarters. Brooks lay back down on the bed and tried to forget the conversation. Of course, he didn't succeed. He had also found Mears fantasizing half-asleep a few times and understood far more of his stammering than Sokov and Bronstein. He no longer doubted that Mears' nightmares were no mere figments of his imagination. But it was better to feign indifference. He knew several of the guardsmen he had accompanied over the last two years and was now in the dark about their fate. He doubted that they had been sent to the Apony worlds to lead a quiet and peaceful life in accordance with their glorious deeds. The faces of two people he had met a good eight years ago mingled with his musings. They were in the service of Gorak, Zurak Mistray's younger brother. And now they were here. There had to be a reason why they had come back into the service of House Mestre in such a special roundabout way. He couldn't remember their names, and they had certainly forgotten him. But Brooks was good at remembering faces. He never forgot a face. Never. Chapter 6 Longhill shared the container with his former officers, Ableton and Cleese. They lay or sat on their cots and were silent for a long time. Each of them was skeptical about the situation. They were all experienced enough to show a certain amount of suspicion when things went too smoothly or shit suddenly turned to gold. Promotion to the bodyguard of Admiral Zurak Mestre. The prospect of a soldier's pension on the ominous refuge world. It all sounded too good to swallow without hesitation. They didn't need to discuss any of this. The three of them had known each other for years and were able to interpret the messages in their silence. Longhill Ableton and Cleese served together on a destroyer named Topus before joining the Akato. On behalf of the fleet, they had fought against gangs of gangsters and pirates for a number of years, and after the invasion they were responsible for the evacuation of various colonies. In a clash with raiders, the Topus was badly damaged and drifted helplessly through space for days. All calls for help seemed to come to nothing and it was only by chance that they were discovered by a civilian freighter, which eventually took the crew on board. This event marked the three officers' break with the fleet, which had done nothing to rescue them. With their small fortune, they managed to gain access to the bouncers of the Akato Towers and ended up on Dostra, where they spent the last seven years fighting for the horseheads. That guy, Cleese began, finally breaking the silence. That Serwan. Brooks, reminded Ableton. Yes, Brooks. He may have talked like one of our grinders, but I don't buy it. He's never been face to face with an enemy. How would you know? Some kind of feeling, Cleese replied. The whole lecture was a play to scare a simpleton into not asking any questions. 
And if someone did, then this admiral comes along, stands in front of us in his operetta uniform and blathers on about sanctuary. Carrot and stick, added Ableton. Long Hill rubbed his eyes tiredly. Yes, there was something for everyone. But I'm not going to let it turn my head either. He looked around. I wonder why not a single member of the old squad is here to brief us. I think so, Cleese said. That Brooks isn't part of the fighting squad. If one of them had been there, I wouldn't have minded him kicking my ass with a running start. But the speech from that painted monkey was a laughing stock. Are we supposed to count out to him? He can't really expect that from us. Long Hill shook his head. Believe me, David. I'm sure this guy has so much power to heat us up, a kick from a grinder would be like a gentle slap on the backside. And if we worry too much? Ableton objected. What if the soldiers are having a picnic on green meadows in the shade of large trees? That's also possible. Of course, Long Hill conceded. But we can't be sure. There is a possibility that the truth will be kept from us. Fighters with a clear vision in mind are better motivated. Paradise is a very powerful image. It causes almost religious fervor. Someone like that only questions when it's too late. I have never belonged to this category of people. Ableton scratched his chin thoughtfully and where else would they be? Dead? Burned up in a pointless battle? Cleese sat up. What do we do if the others have similar thoughts and discuss the matter? That will cause unrest. We advise them to keep their fantasies to themselves. Longhill's words sounded sharp and commanding. It's nice if our troops aren't made up of fools. But I don't want the musings to start running rampant, even if they're justified. I want anyone who says anything to that effect to be folded up by you. All we need to do is rack our brains. Ableton tapped his upper arm. I don't see any rank insignia, he reminded his former captain. We're all on the same level now. It might be difficult to order people to do anything. They'll remember who's been telling them where the hammer hangs. Nobody should imagine that they can sit in my chair. If anyone thinks my threats are empty words, I'll be happy to prove them wrong. Chapter 7 Dominic woke up even before the alarm clock went off. He had fallen asleep after a feeling of dizziness had set in that marked his entry into hyperspace, or whatever the Akato called it. Apparently it had been the same feeling that was now startling him out of sleep. The others, however, were still in a deep slumber. He could hear their regular breaths in the darkness. It was Stephanie, on the cot above him, and Kelman, Gardner, Bowers and Leach in the beds next to it and at the front of the container. He glanced at the clock set into the wall at the foot of his sleeping alcove. Its luminous digits showed 8 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock in the morning in a 32-hour cycle that had to be followed on board the ship. A schedule identical to the daily routine on Otrokin. After all, that meant long rest periods at night. An advantage, if you ignored the fact that this meant equally long night shifts. Dominic heard Stephanie move and yawn. Kelman also stirred and grumbled to himself. Is 0800? Are 0600? Stephanie asked sleepily. Dominic was still too tired to give an exact estimate. I suppose so. Stephanie sat up and let her legs dangle over the edge of the bed. The movement brought the room lighting to life and filled the container with a dull, bluish glow. Dominic liked what he saw. Stephanie had beautiful legs. While he was still looking at her, she jumped onto the floor, dressed in nothing more than a pair of panties and a shirt that reached just above her hips. It was a beautiful sight that made up for his early awakening. I'll be the first to take a shower, she said and disappeared into the bathing chamber. Who knows how long they'll have hot water here. The sanitary area actually had room for all six residents of the accommodation. But they were not yet in a hurry that would justify depriving Stephanie of her pleasure. The water began to rush. 
If that's true about the hot water, said Marcus Kalman, also jumping off his cot, then I don't want to waste any time. Without hesitating for long, he went to Stephanie in the shower. You must be crazy, Stephanie scolded, her voice revealing that she wasn't kidding. Did I invite you? Don't be like that, Kelman replied. We're all comrades. Fuck off. Are you serious? I'm serious, you ass. Kelman returned and lay down on his cot again. What a load of shit. Like I wanted anything from her. Not my type at all. He raised his voice. Did you hear me? You're not my type. Fuck you, came from the bathing area. Someone understands women, grumbled the former field hockey player and wrapped himself in the blanket. Strangely enough, Dominic couldn't laugh about it. A few days ago it might have been different. But it wasn't good to be so informal with each other in such a confined space. It would lead to tension sooner or later. Perhaps it was better to lay down a few rules after all. We should make a plan for when we go to the bathrooms, said Dominic. Kelman laughed. It's better to get that kind of crap out of our heads right away. I think we should think about it. Kelman didn't answer at first, but eventually he replied with a smug undertone. It's not our problem if you've made a mistake. Dominic tried to come up with a retort, but he was unable to. The words were like lead on the tip of his tongue. That's right, Kelman added. Dominic was still struggling to find the right answer. Don't worry, the tall man reassured her. I won't interfere with you. But I'd still prefer it if we could leave feelings out of it and just concentrate on the fun. Feelings turn every flea into an elephant. Dominic stared at the ceiling, listening to the pattering of the water and imagining it running over Stephanie's body. Kelman was right. It would be complicated if he didn't manage to keep it to companionable feelings. He thought back to Elena. They had had a good time until they parted ways. The last few days had made it easy for him to get over his feelings of sorrow. Come to think of it, it had actually been quite a long time since he had last thought about her. Since her departure, there had only been fights and dangers that made it easier for him not to think about Elena all the time. When he had visited the Apony ship in the secret cave with Longhill and his officers, his thoughts of Elena had been more intense. Since then, there had been few opportunities to reminisce about their time together. Should Longhill's plans to make the old relic airworthy again take shape, there might be an opportunity to return to Earth and see Elena again. After all, the ship needed a pilot and Elena seemed to Dominic to be a suitable candidate. But at the moment, a return to Earth was more than unlikely. At the moment, he wasn't keen to see his burnt and destroyed homeland again. Just the thought of his family, who had perished in an inferno of flames and explosions, made him shudder. Stephanie's voice mingled with the sound of the roaring water as she began to sing a song. She's killing me now, Kelman grumbled. It's nice, Dominic defended the young woman. So much good humor after getting up is a crime. One of the Serwin's assistants, whose name was Bronstein if Dominic remembered correctly, ordered the new guardsmen to follow him. They entered another part of the deck that had been closed until then. Behind the wide bulkhead was a training room with a variety of battle machines standing around as if they had been abandoned in the middle of a battle and switched off. This is the armory, Bronstein explained, pointing to the rows of heavy and light handguns resting in their holders on one wall. Before each mission, they will collect their weapons here and return them after the mission. The same goes for the light body armor there. They have to put them on for every mission. Dominic looked at the suits of armor that lined the wall like statues all the way to the end of the hall. They were apparently made of the same reddish wood as the protective suits they had worn on Dostra. Bronstein led the soldiers through the army of fighting machines. Training units, he informed them. You can equip them with slashing, stabbing and shooting devices that simulate energy projectiles. Not lethal, but extremely unpleasant if you come into contact with them. And now for the procedures. He paused. 
Your ultimate superior will be Zira Odana. She reports only to the Admiral and will convey his orders to you. She will always be in the vicinity of Zurak Mestre and will direct them via hollow radio. Don't worry too much for the time being. Her orders will only ever have one purpose. Protect the Admiral. So you'd better never let Zurak out of your sight. Bronstein opened the bulkhead at the end of the hall, revealing a small hangar. Inside were aircraft intended for use by humans. Dominic recognized two large, armed transports and a good 20 fighters for two pilots and a rear gunner. They were heavily modified ships from the fleet's shipyards, Dominic realized. Over the next few hours, you will receive an intensive briefing on how the Akato fight, Bronstein continued. In about 64 hours, House Mestre will launch an attack on the world of Barathon. They will have the task of protecting the Admiral's attack ship. The pilots among them should have no trouble handling the vehicles. He glanced at the display on his left forearm. I'll now call up those of you who already have experience as pilots. He then called out about 50 names. The dark-haired Dora Foster was among them. Take a look at your vehicles, he ordered and the pilots set off to inspect their ships. And now for those we know were instructors. Again he called out a series of names. There were ten of them. Three women, seven men. You're familiar with the training robots? The ten soldiers replied with a hesitant yes. Somehow they seemed to have problems with the young Serwan, whom they obviously didn't consider their equal. Bronstein approached the oldest of the ten. A man of about sixty, but wiry and trained, with fierce dark eyes. You'll make sure the squad is ready for action in two days. The man eyed Bronstein disparagingly. What's your name? After all, Bronstein had a knack for knowing what tone to strike with overconfident soldiers and what kind of face to make. Roderick Miles. Without perhaps intending to, he assumed his stance, even if the salute was a little careless. Bronstein searched for the corresponding name on his arm display. Gunnery Sergeant, he read out. Expert in close combat tactics. Miles held back from confirming. If it says so. The young Serwan was surprisingly good at not letting disdain get to him. I think. They'll manage. The equipment should be largely familiar to them all. It comes from Earth and has been slightly modified. You get right to work, Miles. I'll hold you responsible if Zurak Mestre isn't satisfied with the performance of your people. With that, he turned and left the troops alone. Miles waited until the Serwan was out of sight and earshot before he set about carrying out the order. Form a line and count, he barked. Divide into groups of ten. You two, Longhill. Cleese, Ableton. Their asses are mine for the next few hours. Chapter 8 The training sessions with Miles and the other instructors were torture. Dominic got more bruises and bruises than in all the battles before. He was more exhausted than after a combat mission and had to vomit twice during the lessons from exertion. The few days in the infirmary had taken their toll on his condition. But his comrades were no better off. As far as Longhill and his former officers were concerned, Miles wasn't lying. The former captain broke down a few times and got a good scolding every time. Dominic was reminded of Rosslyn, who never seemed to run out of curses. But Miles was far superior to the Zora's helmsman. There were only a few who were not bothered by the grinding. Stephanie Dormer was one of them and she completed her exercises with seemingly little difficulty. Even during the fencing exercises with the robots, she didn't have to take a single blow. She dodged and struck without showing any signs of exhaustion. Davis and Skorsky also seemed to have survived the whole ordeal well. At any rate, they were laughing and joking as the whole troop headed back to their accommodation. Dora Foster was delighted with the vehicles that Akato had made available to them. Her dark eyes sparkled as she talked about it. They've combined the best parts of different series, she explained. Targeting devices from the European Federation. 
plasma and rail guns from the Russo-Asian states. Sounds like you've fallen in love, said Stephanie. Up to my ears. Rail guns and plasma cannons? Dominic remembered recognizing the mostly useless weapons on the ship Dora was talking about. They just don't do much against Kimon spaceships. What about the other cannons? The two big things on the sides? What kind of weapons are those? You're right, said Dora. The rails and plasma launchers are for snoopers. But the cannons you're talking about are something else. By design, they could be from Earth. But I looked at the output values. The diagrams show values 10 to the power of 3 above those of the most powerful cannons are fleet uses. Looks like they've put battery power into our design. Apparently our technology isn't that bad after all. It just needs a little pimping and it can keep up. She whistled appreciatively through her teeth. These babies are a match for any ship from an earthly shipyard. I can't wait to see how it feels to shoot around with these guns. Dominic knew that Dora had been a pilot in the fleet. But so far, the rather reserved woman had said little about her past. But now she was literally bursting out of her mouth. I'm calling the ship Lucy, she announced. I'll give her another pinup. A snow cat. I've already got something in mind. You'll love it. Good idea, commented Leech. We should try to stay together. You can't tear a good team apart. It felt good to return to the accommodation and close the door behind him. He was looking forward to a hot shower and the thought of lying down on the cot and sleeping. Dominic and the others undressed and went to the washroom. This time there were no discussions about who had to shower when. They were all too tired to discuss any sensitivities now. Kelman, Gardner, Leach and Bowers looked downright apathetic and were unresponsive. But they were all quietly muttering curses and imprecations to themselves. Mantra-like, the names of the instructors appeared in them, with all sorts of metaphors for all sorts of creatures from the animal world. Finally, they went to sleep. As they unanimously affirmed, they were all more dead than alive. Dominic stayed in the shower for a while longer, letting the warm water trickle down his back as he leaned against the wall. He dreaded the next day, when the torture would continue. Do you want me to soap your back? Stephanie asked. You look like you need help. Dominic winced. He thought she had gone with the others. You put up quite a fight today, she said appreciatively and activated the soap dispenser. You seem to have enjoyed the torture, Dominic replied. I've always been in good shape. She began rubbing the cold soap gel on his shoulders. Dominic flinched. The touch came suddenly and it wasn't because of the coolness of the soap that he began to tremble for a moment. Relax, Stephanie placated. I don't want to seduce you. Although I'd like to see Kelman's face if we both started shagging here. Maybe he thinks we're about to get it on at the moment. If only he knew how good we are. I should moan a bit, what do you think? For a moment, Dominic didn't know whether to be happy or disappointed that there wouldn't be more between them. For a moment, he caught himself thinking that he would just give it a try and get closer to her in more than a friendly way. I'm curious to see what kind of world we'll see, Stephanie continued as she stroked his back. Will it be exotic? Beautiful or forbidding? Hot or cold? Volcanic, misty, swampy. Dominic shook his head. Dostra was exotic enough. And we'll be fighting, not going on excursions. I don't see what could excite me about the prospect. Promise me we'll stay together. Dominic turned his head and looked at Stephanie. I don't understand. We're a good team, she said. It's purely a survival instinct. I don't want to bite the dust before my time. And I feel safe with you. Dominic would have liked to have heard something else. He couldn't say what exactly she should have said. 
No romantic words or any of the pompous phrases that lovers usually whispered to each other suited Stephanie. But perhaps he was expecting too much of her. For the attractive, blonde woman, Dominic seemed to be merely a means to an end. A motive that actually corresponded exactly to the image he had of her. That wasn't a bad motive in itself. Safety was the best thing you could wish for in her situation. From that point of view, he obviously had more to offer in her eyes than any of the other men in the troupe. Still, he had to admit to himself that he wanted something else from her right now, like to be seen as a bodyguard. He was still deep in thought when Stephanie suddenly kissed him and clung to him. Her legs wrapped around his hips as her tongue slipped into his mouth. At that moment, all his thoughts melted away and all that remained was lust, which swept all shame aside. He didn't care if their comrades were nearby and could catch them at any time. He didn't care if they would hear him and Stephanie. All that mattered now was this moment together. Chapter 9 From the wide hangar bulkhead, which was sealed by a transparent energy field, the humans were presented with a fascinating view of a green world whose appearance was dominated by large forested areas of land. Otrokin, as Serwan Brooks had previously explained. Homeworld of the House of Mestre. An important metropolis of Askarun, he affirmed. Whereupon he named a few cities that had produced great heroes and artists in the past, who were important for the rise of the planet. Dominic gazed at the shimmering world as it curved before his eyes. Numerous lakes glittered between high, snow-covered mountain ranges, like shards of glass reflecting the sunlight. He could recognize rivers that followed natural courses and those that were unmistakably forced into a geometric pattern. As was to be expected with the Akato, round shapes predominated. The bodies of water stretched across the land in a complex network that was strongly reminiscent of Nordic runic drawings. The structures of the towns that nestled against the waters also resembled curved decorations reminiscent of artistic reliefs. The many towers reaching far into the sky were striking and familiar to Dominic from Earth. On Otrokin, however, there were far more. Like arrows in the body of an animal, they peppered the surface of the planet. The large number of ships moving in Otrokin's orbit was also fascinating. They flew fast and in wide orbits around the planet, gathering around the tops of the towers or docking on their platforms. The Jadaira approached one of these towers, which rose out of the jumble of houses in a city that had many more straight lines and right angles than the other metropolises Dominic had recognized from orbit when he looked down on Otrokin. Dominic looked over at Davis and Skorsky, who, in contrast to Longhill and his tunnel rats, seemed strangely untouched. They must have seen something similar before. Unbelievable, muttered Gardner and Stephanie nodded silently in agreement. At least we don't have to fight. Gardner's conclusion was well-founded when Dominic looked at the uniforms they were wearing. Parade uniforms with lots of gold trim, which they had just been issued today. The green vine patterns on the blue fabric were even more intricate than on the standard uniforms. Trip with the troops I suppose, said Dominic, watching Davis and Skorsky put their heads together. Looks like the Akato want to take us on a tour of the castles. Davis knew that Dominic's words had been meant for him. He crossed his arms behind his back and approached him. Do us a favor, kid, Davis began, and try not to stand out. If we meet Ulan Mestre, I can't guarantee anything. We're not going to meet him, Davis replied. How do you know that? With a nod of his head, he pointed out to one of the towers circling the ship. That's new architecture. He was obviously referring to the city that spread out around the foot of the tower in all directions. And that means? Mestre is a traditionalist, said Davis. So my money's on Zurak, Gorak and their friends. That's who we'll meet. The tower was now out of sight. The Jadaira turned to tie up with the bow at a landing bay. Brooks ordered the guardsmen to line up in rows of four and follow him. He led them through the ship's seemingly endless main corridor to the bow. It was a long walk, but they didn't have to walk in step, and it reminded Dominic once again of the dimensions he had to deal with, which the Akato preferred. 
Everything had to be enormous, forcing someone to physically confront the splendor of their realm. A wide bulkhead at the end of the corridor was already open, revealing a wide hall filled with vehicles of all kinds. Tanks, fighters, and a lot of other war equipment, ready to be loaded into the Jadaira. Xurax warriors, all dressed in splendid parade uniforms, began to climb into vehicles that were obviously not intended for military use and were part of the tower's transportation system. Serwan Brooks went inside and instructed the guardsmen to hold onto the poles that the Akato were clinging to. The handrails were at eye level with the people, barely reaching the Akato's chest. Dominic felt like a child among adults in a crowded train compartment. At least there was enough space between the rows so that the lizard-like tails of the horses' heads were out of reach. They wagged back and forth restlessly. The tension of the fighters was palpable, suggesting that the gathering was not just some kind of celebration to honor the soldiers for their bravery in past battles. Never before had he been so close to so many Akato. The crushing mass of their massive bodies almost took his breath away. A feeling of claustrophobia overcame him and settled on his chest like a stone weighing tons. We'll probably get a few medals pinned on, Kelman remarked. Or we'll get a trophy for outstanding team performance. Someone laughed. Or a kick in the ass in front of everyone. With the Akato, you'd better be ready for anything. One of the horseheads turned around and looked at the man from Longhill's troop. He bared his teeth and said something that sounded like slaughtered cattle. But Dominic could have misheard him. Campfi Gut continued the Akato, who could speak a few scraps of various human languages. Brave Womo du Scalver. So that you sont utils. Otherwise no more than Odpity. Serwan Brooks was on hand and the Akato turned away. Brooks addressed the giant creature. But he spoke so quietly that Dominic couldn't hear a word he said. Then he walked away again and the Akato put their heads together. Apparently to find out from their comrade what the Serwan had said. But the man did not move and looked petrified. When his comrades did not let up, he reacted with growls and snarls. He hit one of them on the shoulder with his fist. I don't like the whole thing, said Jeremy Leach, who had been watching the scene closely. Why do you say that, demanded Bowers, whose usually flushed cheeks had taken on a certain pallor. These guys are all tense, he said. And I know a few languages. What the horses had said didn't sound very friendly. That's something completely new. Kelman laid a friendly hand on Leach's shoulder. I mean it differently. Before Kelman could make another flippant remark, Dominic addressed Leech. What do you mean? It sounded personal. The young man searched in vain for the right words. It seemed like a threat. Specifically directed at us. It's better if you just shut up, Skorsky intervened in the discussion. Akato just wanted to scare you. And he succeeded. But keep your fear to yourself. Got it? Leech started to reply, but swallowed the words. Finally, the transporter drove off and chased through the corridors and halls of the tower. Once or twice it entered an elevator that took the vehicle to the upper floors. When they reached another hall, the doors opened and the passengers got out. An Akato officer ordered his comrades to form up and Brooks also gave the order, whereupon the guardsmen once again formed up in their usual line of four. Shortly afterwards, the Akata marched off and the humans fell into step to keep up with the horses' heads. They finally reached the gateway into a gigantic hall. The dome was formed from a web of branches and twigs that arched in a complex pattern over the heads of countless soldiers who had come into the hall from other entrances. In its structure, it reminded Dominic of the brown-green veins of autumn leaves through which a blue sky shone. Gold and precious stones glittered on the pillars that ran into the fine branches. In the center of the dome, the sun shone through a round opening. Its rays fell vertically on a kind of tribune, reminiscent of the rootstock of a tree felled with a smooth cut. Zurak Mestre stood on it, surrounded by a few officers and two figures in black robes. They were unmistakably religious dignitaries. One of them was waving an incense burner. 
the sight alone made Dominic feel nauseous. It brought back memories of the school services of his childhood. The smell of the incense had made him vomit or faint several times. Reverend Milton had always been full of compassion and had finally excused him from attending. Dominic did not expect to meet with understanding from the Akato if he defiled the sacred hall with the contents of his stomach. He sincerely hoped that the fumes of the consecrated incense would not waft over to him. He watched suspiciously as they billowed into a gray cloud above the heads of the Akato in the stands. A group of Akato with long wooden trombones stepped out from behind Zurak and put the instruments to their bulging lips. A discordant sound, reminiscent of the bellowing of a herd of cows caught in barbed wire, filled the room. The hairs on the back of Dominic's neck stood on end as the horrible sound swelled to a deafening crescendo until it suddenly died away. The brass players put down their trombones and remained in their positions. After the noise, the silence was almost unbearable. Zurak didn't need a loudspeaker system to make his voice boom through the hall. The architecture did its part to carry his every word in the harsh Akata language to every ear. Dominic understood none of them, but what the prince's son said sounded upbeat and incantatory. A battle speech, no doubt. The prelude to an impending campaign. It was precisely timed and was just the right length to avoid overwhelming the listener. It was certainly filled with simple, common phrases that justified in advance all the horrors that would follow in the war. Dominic found himself thinking that he would have no problem with Zurak calling down the curse of hell on the Kimon and all their children. Did the Kimon even have such a thing as children? Did they know the principle of family? And if not, was that all the more reason to exterminate them? For some reason, he hated the Beatles, even if they were just warriors fighting for their cause. Perhaps it was their strangeness and the fact that he blamed them for the loss of his family. Perhaps it was also because the Sniffers, who were also known as Kimon, had more in common with animals than with rational creatures. No, Dominic had no problem with that part of the war. But it was also quite possible that the Akato were also at war with other races. Peoples that humans had never had anything to do with before. Just as Dominic had reached this point in his deliberations, Zurak's speech ended and the hall shook with thunderous applause. The Akato began to roar and stamp their boots, so much so that one feared the floor would crack, give way and collapse at any moment. The roar sounded like the noise of battle, mingled with the enthusiastic shouts of the soldiers. Zurak! 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 At the height of the cheering, the wind players put their instruments to their lips again. Once again, the cacophony of their trumpet blasts filled Dominic's maltreated ears, but when the all-pervading discord had faded, silence reigned in the hall. A single shout was heard from the other end of the hall and the soldiers took up their positions. The humans, too, involuntarily followed the example of their horse-headed comrades. Stand still! Serwan Brooks ordered the humans. Admiral Zurak has something else to tell you. Again the words of an order wafted in, from someone Dominic could not see. The Akato began to move closer together until the humans stood alone as a group. Brooks and his aides strode through the alley that had been created. He ordered Dominic and the others to follow him in loose step. A strange order, but at least it prevented them from embarrassing themselves, stumbling awkwardly over the polished wooden floor or approaching the admiral too cavalierly. It had been a long time since Dominic had had to parade in step. And Serwan Brooks obviously knew that his companions also had little practice in performing such balletic feats. Shortly before the grandstand, the Serwan gave the order to stop and take a stand. The Tribune had a wide staircase carved into the stylized tree stump. Two of the religious dignitaries now came down the steps. One of them carried a large bowl of polished wood, the other held a frond of long white hair. At least no incense, Dominic thought to himself as the two Akato began to circle the troop of humans. Meanwhile, one of them repeatedly dipped his frond into the bowl and sprayed fragrant water over their heads. Murmuring incessantly, he finally finished the procedure, after which he went back up the stairs with his assistant. Once at the top, he spread his arms and shouted something. You dare Cain. 
Dominic memorized the words exactly. They could be heard clearly and distinctly and had a solemn, ominous sound. This was followed by another round of applause, which almost drowned out the words that Gardner uttered. That was the blessing for the Easter lambs, Dominic heard him say. Then they cut their throats. Chapter 10 Dominic felt every muscle in his body. They hurt just as much as the bruises and contusions he had sustained while training with the combat automatons. He felt the pain all the more because he was in his armor, which wasn't quite adjusted here and there and was pressing on the sore spots. He was betting that his comrades were feeling the same and hoped that there wouldn't be any fights today that would take the whole man. They returned to the Jadira, which immediately cast off and left the planet. Dominic was now in the front line of the troops entrusted with protecting the Admiral and had taken up position in the Jadira's large hangar. Serwan Brooks and his two aides had taken up positions in front of the Admiral's bodyguard and were waiting for orders. The alarm sirens wailed. The sound swelled up and down, like a lament. There was something strangely beautiful and sublime about it that touched Dominic deeply as he let his eyes wander over the scene. To describe the ranks of Akata soldiers in their shimmering silver battle dress as impressive would have been an understatement. They stood in neat formations between the landing legs of the battleships that would soon carry them into battle. But the sight of this battle-ready army was not the only thing that took Dominic's breath away. Through the huge open bulkhead, he could see the Akato fleet gathering in space. There were far more ships now than they had seen when they arrived two days ago. Apparently there were several battle formations that had just joined together to form a single fleet. Zurak Mestre appeared as an oversized hologram in front of his warriors and swore them in for the coming battle. Dominic again didn't understand a single word of the edgy, harsh Akato language. No matter. They had the same sound as all words spoken with the purpose of preparing a creature for the coming kill. When the admiral had finished speaking, his fighters raised their fists and rifles and shouted at the top of their lungs so that the air vibrated. The hologram went out and the Akato began to climb into their ships via the extended ramps. Serwan Brooks and his two aides turned to the guardsmen. A ghostly hollow projection rose up next to Brooks. It showed a female Akato with a black mane. Unlike her male counterparts, she had a shorter snout and larger eyes. Her skin color was dark, almost black. A golden nose ring, like the ones Dominic had seen on bulls, adorned her face. The strange face reminded him vaguely of a basalt bust he had once seen in a museum. The face of an Egyptian deity that had looked at him with an unfathomable gaze and sent a shiver down his spine. The woman's voice was deep, but less booming, like the Academons, and didn't have as much of an accent. A natural talent, Dominic wondered, or a sign that she had studied the humans more closely than the other Akato? I'm Zira Odana, she began, I'll be leading you in the upcoming missions. We do not expect any large enemy units at the deployment site. It will be a simple and quick operation. Watch and learn. The hologram dissolved and Serwan Brooks took command again. To your ships. Circle the Jadira. Do not move more than 10 kilometers away. Dora Foster hurried into the ship at the head of the snowcats. In addition to the familiar group of friends, five companions from the Tunnel Rats were also on board to bring the crew up to the required number. There were four men and one woman who didn't seem too thrilled to be separated from their trusted comrades. Dominic had no idea how Dora had managed to paint the image of a stylized, stalking cat on the side of the ship. She stared down at the troops from beneath the pulpit window with a fierce expression. The rows of seats for the crew were arranged in the usual way along the side of the ship. They had all taken their seats and felt the pressure of the holding fields as Dora Foster started the engines and steered the Lucy out of the hangar. Dominic could see the hangar walls gliding past through the viewing hatches opposite. The star-studded expanse of space came into view until the bluish shimmer of a planet came into view. Dora performed a loop and returned to the Jadira. For the next few minutes she orbited the huge flagship until the tunnel rats began to express their displeasure. Is that our job now? growled one of the men. Flying around in circles until we die of boredom? 
That would be fine with me, replied the woman next to him. I don't feel like fighting. Dominic was torn between the two opinions. It was still too early to fight against whoever. On Dostra, they were merely protection troops. Small units that had to coordinate with each other. Now they were part of a fleet unit whose fighting style they were not yet familiar with. He hoped they would not actively intervene in the action, but observe. He decided to join Dora in the cockpit, left the crew compartment and hurried through the narrow corridor to the cockpit. There were four seats in rows of two. You don't have a co-pilot? Dominic wondered. I don't know who I could take, she said, inviting him to sit in the seat next to her with a nod of her head. Dominic complied with her request and sat down. Found a co-pilot, she joked. It's not my thing. He raised his hands. I don't want to break anything. I'll take care of you. It's primarily about distributing the shield energy and handling the weapons. I can do it on my own, but you should never resist support. Meanwhile, Dominic admired the view that presented itself to him. There was the Jadira with all its escort ships, and the Earth-like planet stretching out in front of the window. He saw the ships of the attack units rushing towards the blue world of Barathon. Circle and keep a lookout, Dominic concluded. Those are your orders, I assume. Roughly, replied Dora. Protecting the admiral, staying close to him and fending off attackers. She grinned mockingly. And hope he doesn't do anything stupid. However, this hope seemed to be dashed in the next moment, as a segment of the ship broke away from underneath the bridge, which bulged out of the hole like a bulge. It looked like a splinter of wood and moved towards the planet. At the same moment, a hologram appeared above the console, showing Zira Odana. It appeared that she was on one of the escort units, sitting in a pilot's seat, judging by the environment the projector was generating. The admiral has decided to follow the attack boats, she began, close up to the command boat and keep your eyes open. The image went out. Command boat, Dora repeated. That must be the wood splinter. Dominic sighed. Now we'll see what it means when Zurak goes into the thick of the action. I was expecting it. When Dominic wanted to return to the others, Dora held him back. I wouldn't mind if you stayed. I'm not going to be any help to you, he objected. We'll see about that. The Lucy and the other ships followed the strange fragment as it approached the planet. Dominic could see details that suggested it was heavily armed. He saw short-barreled cannons and openings for torpedoes or missiles. Two similar vehicles were approaching to assist the Admiral. It's best if you inform the team about the change of plan, suggested Dominic. Dora made an announcement and shortly afterward Stephanie, Davis and Skorsky appeared. The two men sat down in the empty seats, while Stephanie stood between Dominic and Dora. Orbital battle? she asked. No, said Davis. They're going down. In an orbital battle, the big pots would stay closer. But they're obviously falling behind. He pointed to the tactical hollow above the console. They're securing the space further out. Dominic turned to him. So you've fought in a battle formation like this before. I told you we were fighting for the Akato, Davis replied in astonishment. I didn't think their experience extended beyond penal colony worlds like Dostra. He looked at Skorsky, who made no bones about it. We never said they did. But you shouldn't say more than you have to. It only leads to unnecessary questions. Now you know, okay? And how do you feel about that? Good feeling? Dominic had ambivalent feelings. What role had you played with the Akato in the past? Were you a guardsman? And if so, with which of the Mestre sons? Obviously not with Zurak. They would have been found out long ago if they had done anything wrong, which Dominic thought was very likely. Stephanie pointed outside. There's a Kimon blade. 
Dominic saw the slender needle gleaming in the sunlight and shining like a jet of flame across the curved horizon into space. The Admiral's ship is stopping, Dora announced. The attack boats swarm out and open fire. The Kimon are returning fire. You could see the explosions and flashes of light from the volleys that lit up the surface of Baratin. The wedge-shaped Admiral ship aimed its bow at the Kimon formation and unleashed its full firepower. Several projectiles missed the blade's protective shield, but the force field was already flickering and letting a few energy beams through. Around the blade, the defensive turrets began to engage in battle. Fingers of light scanned for the Admiral's ship. Glittering orbs of energy chased towards it. Dora jerked the wheel around. Damn it, she shouted, should we intercept the volleys with our ships? There are ships rising. Dominic tried to activate the heavy weapons. I don't have access to the cannons. Dora flicked a few switches. You've got them now. But I'm not giving the go-ahead yet. Put on the visor helmet. Ever done that? Sure. Dominic had once had the opportunity to operate the main guns in this way on the Zora. But only as part of a practice battle. He hoped this experience would be enough for the upcoming battle. When he put on the helmet, he was immersed in a black world of lines, numbers, and symbols. A conspicuous crosshair moved into his field of vision as he moved the two handles on the armrests. I think I can manage that. It's similar to our battle armor. The cannons swung back and forth. The heavy gears in their joints made the walls of the ship vibrate. After all, the whole structure made a solid and promising impression. Dominic hoped he wasn't mistaken. Dora shooed Stephanie out of the pulpit. Davis and Skorsky, however, were allowed to remain seated. After all, they could be useful. I'm going on an intercept course, Dora informed them, accelerating the Lucy and sitting in front of the Jadira's bow. Weapon power unlocked. You're ready to go. Dominic didn't hesitate for long and took one of the smaller Kimon ships in his crosshairs. It was barely larger than the Lucy and looked like a patterned Damascus blade. From a series of openings, it spewed volleys of energy at Zirak's ship. Dominic pulled the trigger and released two arrows of light that struck the Kimon in the side. They blew the enemy in half. Dominic couldn't believe that he had just destroyed one of the spacecraft he thought was invulnerable. How that's awesome! Dora flew a wide turn around the Akato ship, which was now being attacked by more attackers. Feels good, doesn't it? Great feeling to get back at the bugs, Dominic replied, looking for a new Kimon to set his sights on. Dora sat down behind one of the daggers, which was trying to gain some distance before launching another attack. If it were up to us, said the pilot, we should give the Akato a few things too. Don't say that too loudly. Dominic pulled the trigger again, but nothing happened. The Kimon was able to steal out of the crosshairs unchallenged. Damn it! Firepower has its costs, of course. Dora made every effort not to let her opponent shake her off. Takes 30 seconds to recharge. A little longer if I accelerate. Dominic watched the Kimon and the energy bar building up in his target display. 98%, 99. Charged. Dominic fired and missed the target. Are you crazy? Dora shouted, losing her composure for a moment. How could that happen? That was a sure shot. The Kimon did everything he could to shake off his pursuers. The pilot had to use all her skills to prevent him from escaping. 20%. 22. The charging bar didn't seem to want to grow any higher. Meanwhile, the beetle's companions were approaching. Dora called the tunnel rats for help, but they had their own problems. I'm pulling shield energy, she explained, I'll do everything I can to buy you time. 50, percent. 60, 70. Don't screw it up now. In the meantime, she was back at the rear of the Kimon fighter, its four star-shaped engines glowing in blue light outside the cockpit window. 
90, 95. Charged. Dominic fixed the fighter behind the crosshairs and allowed himself one more breath before pulling the trigger. The full energy charge hit the enemy, eating through the deflector field in a fraction of a second and blowing the ship's hull into a million fragments. Dora wrenched the wheel around and chased past the cloud of debris. However, several fragments crashed against the shield. The ship's systems were drawing power from the reactor, but Dora pushed the thrust pedals to the limit. The display for the cannon charge was apparently frozen at zero. Three Kimon, Dora informed them and flew closer to Zurak's ship. Close up quickly. I'll try to guide them into the Jadira's defensive fire. Let's hope the Akato make a point of saving our asses, Dominic said. After all, his concerns proved to be unfounded. As soon as they came within range of the guns, the Jadira gunners fired their light lances at the Kimon. Two targets were destroyed, the others scattered in all directions. We are with you now, a pilot's voice could be heard coming from the loudspeaker of the radio system. The Akato have just taken the bread out of your soup, Dora replied. That won't happen again, the pilot replied. Especially if we can avoid wasting time getting you out of trouble. You haven't so far. Dora did a loop and sat back down in front of the bow of the Jadira. There were only a few smaller enemy units left in the ship's flight path. A few Akato battleships closed in and fired broadsides at the Kimon cruisers, which retreated to the vicinity of the turret, its defensive guns landing hits on the Jadira. Meanwhile, Akato landing craft had managed to descend near the Kimon blade and knock out the guns in its vicinity. I can't wait to see if the horseheads want to conquer this thing, Dora pondered aloud. It'll take forever and if the Admiral wants to get involved, we'll have to get in there too. The idea sent a shiver down Dominic's spine. I hope not. The Jadira stopped a few kilometers above the top of the tower and fired volley after volley at the building. The other battleships joined in the destruction with all their might, punching huge holes in the tower. Black smoke billowed out of countless cracks. Flames leapt into the air. Dora circled around the Jadira. Zurak raked the tower and the jungle that surrounded its foundations. Dominic thought he could see that there was fighting going on. He adjusted his visor and took a closer look at the action. Dominic saw large armored vehicles plowing through a forest of blue-green foliage. The giant trees were falling and cutting a swathe through the jungle. Some units had already worked their way up to the tower and were setting explosive charges on its walls. The detonations were powerful and tore large openings in the building. The Akata warriors forced their way inside as soon as the smoke had cleared. Dominic turned his attention to what was happening in orbit. He could no longer see any Kimon ships. However, he thought he saw flashes of explosions. Far away on the planet's horizon. Small bright dots speckled the black above the atmosphere. Another fleet formation. Apparently the attack on Barathon was larger than he had previously assumed. The Jadira is accelerating, Dora Dominic announced. Then the Kimon Blade is not the main target. If the Kimon have occupied the planet, it's only likely that they have several fortresses that need to be taken out. Dominic transmitted the view from his visor to the hollow projector. There's fighting there, too. Dora took a few seconds to respond and flicked a few switches on the console. I'm registering about three more targets. A lot of ships are engaged. Dominic wondered how large the prince's son's fleet was. Did the ships currently orbiting the planet all belong to Zurak? And whether they were only part of the fleet he commanded? If so, it must be truly enormous. He felt dizzy at the thought of how many spacecraft the Akato people, ruled by a multitude of noble houses, had at their disposal. The enemy fleets must be correspondingly large. He did not dare to imagine the scale of the wars that the Akato were waging. Chapter 11 The Jadira glided unmolested over the world of Barathon. While the Snowcats and the Lucy accompanied the ship, Dominic was able to observe further battles. Sometimes closer, sometimes further away. 
From the looks of it, the Jadaira was no longer in danger and the Kimon seemed to be in the process of being defeated. Something's coming into view, Dora murmured in awe. Dominic peered out of the window. Directly ahead, a tree-like structure loomed over the planet's horizon. He doubted that it was a giant plant, but rather a building that remotely resembled a bare oak struck by lightning. A dozen or so twisted branches stretched upwards, some of which reached into the upper stratosphere. The whole structure was crisscrossed by floors, characterized by countless rows of openings and windows. Further down, Dominic recognized a complex network of houses and streets extending from its trunk in a star shape, as if they were stone roots. The Jadaira is approaching for landing, the pilot informed us. I've been assigned a touchdown point. What the hell is that, breathed Stephanie, on behalf of everyone else who had come into the cockpit or was standing in the access airlock to watch the landing approach. I haven't gotten any information yet, Dora said, but Davis seemed to know something and shifted uneasily in his seat. This is an Akato palace, he explained. A Murgai. Each of the important worlds has something like this. Murgai, Dominic repeated. This means something like law and refers to the right of an Akato to rule over a conquered world. What's the deal with Barathan? I don't know everything either, replied Davis. There's always new territory to discover. Even for me. Meanwhile, the stars faded and the black of space gave way to the blue of the sky, dotted with white clouds. The artificial tree towered a good hundred kilometers away. Its uppermost foothills pierced a few veils of cloud, while its base was lost in the haze that lay over the land in the distance. Nearby, a few tower-like houses rose out of the lush vegetation, which had apparently been able to overgrow everything for several decades, or centuries. The buildings that marked the edge of the city had the usual Akato design and looked like withered plants. Dominic noticed that the Lucy was touching down on a flat surface that must have once been a landing field. The tunnel rat ships touched down next to them and formed a phalanx, behind which the Jadaira landed. Smaller Akato ships circled at high altitude and secured the surrounding area. The image of the Akato woman appeared above the console. She was obviously still sitting in a cockpit. Leave your ships now and take your positions. Serwan Brooks will give you further information. The hologram went out. How about a congratulations on a successful landing, Dora complained and switched off the engines. The people formed a neat line in front of the Jadaira's bulky bow. A beguiling scent had immediately caught Dominic's nose when the outer bulkhead had opened. A heavy, perfume-like aroma that reminded him of jasmine and was somewhat artificial in its intensity. The thundering of the surf could be heard from afar. It wasn't easy to think about being involved in a combat mission and realize that an inferno could break over them at any moment. Dominic watched as Serwan Brooks, flanked by his two assistants, flew across the grassy plain on a hover sled. He stopped a good stone's throw away and addressed the soldiers. Our task, he began, will be to bring Admiral Zurak and his elite troops to the Murgai. That's the big tree-like tower I hope you haven't missed. He paused. You will also be accompanied by the Gothrax. Don't be alarmed when you meet them. They are with us and have proven to be good support in the fight against the Kimon. Dominic turned to Davis questioningly, but he didn't react at first. Just don't be intimidated, he finally murmured. Be prepared for anything. Serwan Brooks raised his voice. Sweep march. The soldiers instinctively obeyed the tone of voice and the order. Dominic also turned reflexively and walked under Lucy's belly towards the edge of the airfield, which was lined with trees and bushes. Brooks ordered the soldiers to stand still. No matter what happens. It's called standing still. Got it? Yes sir, came from all the throats at the same time. Dominic felt his tension growing. He wondered what might befall him in the next few moments and whether he had the strength not to disobey orders. Certainly, the Akata were stricter about how to obey an order than in the human fleet. He wondered how far you could bend an order without breaking it. 
Dominic felt ambivalent, but at the same time, the companionship of his comrades gave him enough courage to at least resolve to stand still, whatever might happen to them. He knew that the others felt the same way, and that gave him a sense of strength, even if it seemed rather nonsensical. Dominic had to think of his brother. He would certainly have drawn a comparison with Pavlov's dogs and called them all fools. And it wouldn't have been the first time that Dominic had had to agree with Ben. Something was stirring at the edge of the forest. Branches bobbed up and down. Their blue-green leaves trembled. Here and there, the tall grasses under the trees trembled. Sleuth, said one of the soldiers, sending a cold shiver down Dominic's spine. The line did not waver even though Dominic bet that each of them was about to take the safety off their rifles and point them at the creatures that were now crawling out of the undergrowth. On closer inspection, however, he doubted that they were sniffers. The creatures appeared larger, bulkier and had a blue-black color. Their bodies were also covered in shimmering golden patterns that seemed to glow when the creatures moved. Like the sniffers, arm and finger-thick tentacles hung from their heads in thick manies. But they seemed much longer to Dominic than the Kimon he knew. These had to be the Gothrex Brooks had talked about. They crept up slowly. Crouched, like cats eyeing their prey, until one of them shot towards Dominic with two three long leaps. The Gothrek was huge. Its shoulder height was certainly that of a full-grown man and even now, as it crouched in front of Dominic, the sheer mass of its body was overwhelming. The creature's presence had the menacing majesty of a Bangalow tiger Dominic had once seen at the Chicago Zoo. The creature radiated the same power and grace and looked at him with eyes that sparkled like blue ice. In the meantime, his conspecifics had approached and crept cautiously and suspiciously around the soldiers. Brooks, who had certainly witnessed similar situations many times before, watched the action carefully. Brooks finally addressed the soldiers again. Guardsmen, he began in a loud voice. These creatures will have the same task as you on the worlds of the penal colonies. The Gothrex sense the enemy long before they see them. But this similarity is probably all they have in common with their new friends. It's just that it's more pronounced with the Gothrex than with most of you. At this remark, Dominic thought that the Serwin's gaze rested on him for a moment, as if he had spoken directly to him. Did he know that this talent was more evident in Dominic than in his comrades? Admiral Zurak Mestre intends, Brooks continued, to regain possession of the building there. We don't know if Kimon warriors have retreated there and are hiding in the city. Our job will be to find out and destroy any enemy units we come across. All around the city, with its huge center towering far into the sky, ships of the fleet were now descending. They sank with a roar, their massive hulls forming a ring of defensive castles around the buildings of the former metropolis. The soldiers still remained in a guarded position and let the Gothrex sniff and sniff. None of them noticed the admiral approaching with a squad of his fighters and stepping between the humans and the Gothrex. The monsters moved aside, like dogs used to being beaten by their masters. Some jumped away as if they had been electrocuted, others crouched on the ground with quivering tentacles and followed the prince with attentive glances. Zurak Mestre wore a uniform reinforced here and there with armored wood and held a heavy rifle in his hands. Together with his warriors, he walked towards the wall of bushes and trees. Forward! Brooks ordered and the people started moving to follow the prince. Just before they plunged into the shadows of the forest between the trees, Dominic looked back once more. Serwan Brooks and his assistants made no move to join the troops. Instead, he turned the glider around and floated back to the command boat, from which masses of Akato fighters were now pouring out, thundering down the exit ramps. Dominic would have preferred the heavily armed horseheads to have taken the lead of their unit instead of running after them. Should they encounter the kind of Kimon he had met on Chester, the Akato could be more useful moving in front of the humans than behind them. Watch where you're going. Stephanie reprimanded him. Otherwise you'll break your legs. Dominic just managed to avoid tripping over a tree trunk. I'll be careful, he replied, trying to keep his balance. Did you see that? There are thousands of horses' heads coming up behind us. Oh yeah. 
Stephanie gasped. Wouldn't mind if they caught up with us. They had trouble following the admiral and his fighters, who were now moving at a faster pace. The Gothrex could be seen between the trees, leaping over bushes and rocks with fluid movements. They hurried almost silently through the shadows of the forest until the small, unusual army reached the edge of the wood and the darkness lifted. The soldiers stepped out onto a wide street, with low houses rising up on either side, getting higher and higher towards the center of the town, where they lined the trunk of the tree-like tower. The street consisted of large ashlars, with grasses and weeds growing between the joints. Bushes and shrubs also grew along the rows of houses. Something that reminded Dominic of ivy covered the facades and hung in shreds from the roofs, like torn camouflage netting. The town had certainly been uninhabited for years. Now small ships glided across the sky to secure the admiral's advance from the air. Their guns were aimed at imaginary targets as they circled over the city. Dominic was overcome by an uneasy feeling. He didn't know what strategies the Akato had developed for urban warfare, but it had been clear from his reading in the military school that air support was hardly helpful. It merely served to convey a promise of safety to the soldiers on the ground. Attackers hidden in the buildings would strike and then retreat to the shelter of branching corridors and basements. He could not imagine that the horseheads had weapons capable of tracking an enemy through the labyrinth until he was hunted down. That would simply have been too time-consuming. Dominic's gaze involuntarily turned to the Gothrex flanking the troops on either side. They were probably with them for this purpose. Zira Odonna pulled a kind of flute from her belt, put it to her lips and produced a bright, piercing sound that made the Gothrex sit up and take notice. She then raised her arms and performed a few hand movements, whereupon the creature swarmed out, disappeared into the houses or climbed up the facades onto the roofs. I wonder, said Dominic in amazement, why they don't use the critters on the mining worlds. Stephanie nodded with a thoughtful expression. It just occurred to me, too. A secret project? Maybe not quite mature yet. Zurak certainly doesn't want to embarrass himself. Then we're on a test site? Dominic turned to Davis for help, but he just looked silently and expressionlessly into the distance. Skorsky shook his head. That's a real battle, he replied. But I think Zurak wants to impress his father and show off a few successes first. Let's hope he succeeds. Otherwise we're all screwed. Is he cooking his own soup? asked Stephanie. I wouldn't be surprised, said Skorsky. We're dealing with a structure of noble houses here. The sons compete with each other. And everyone has their trump cards to score points with their father. Dominic didn't like being the joker in an interstellar poker game. You mean he's trying to play a trump card by taking back this world? Using us as a secret weapon? With those, as a secret weapon, Skorsky corrected, pointing to the last Gothrex, who were just disappearing into the houses. The banging and hissing of energy projectiles emanated from the buildings. In between roars and snarls. Two three Kimon in their shimmering armor staggered out of one of the entrances, hard-pressed by a group of Gothrex. An Akato in the Admiral's retinue struck down one of the enemies with well-aimed shots. The others were torn to pieces by the monsters. Zurak ordered them to advance as the first soldiers of the regular army came out of the forest and entered the street. Meanwhile, the Gothrex ransacked the houses for more Kimon. There wasn't much for the snowcats and tunnel rats to do once the monstrous creatures had begun their campaign. From time to time, the noise of the battle could be heard, hidden in the corridors and rooms of the buildings. Here and there, one of the ships sent sheaves of destructive energy into the canyons. To all appearances, the Gothrex were doing their job well and shooing the Kimon out into the open. Every now and then, one of the creatures would emerge, crawling over the overgrown walls of the building, snarling and snarling, before disappearing through a window or a crack inside. Chapter 12 The troop made good progress and approached the foundations of the tree, largely unmolested by the Kimon. More than once, a sniffer chased across the street to seek safety in one of the alleyways before a volley knocked him to the ground. 
Dominic sensed the sniffers, their sensations once again forcing their way into his mind. He was even able to pinpoint their locations, like heat sources scattered around the area whose heat radiation he could feel. But there were only a few of them. He didn't get the impression that the Kimon cared much about holding the city. But judging by the effort the Akato made here, they assumed it must be teeming with the bugs. Dominic also thought the town was important. Mainly because of the tree-like building, in which he now recognized countless windows and openings. They suggested that it was not just an oversized sculpture, but a building that served a purpose. The Kimon's activities were still limited and the detectable presence of the snoopers was still small. Dominic couldn't help himself. The situation reminded him of his last minutes on the Zora, before the bomb exploded that had ended his career in the fleet and changed the course of his life. Davis and Skorsky also seemed worried. Longhill had come to see them a few times when the situation allowed and had talked to them. Could be a trap, Dominic ventured to guess, whereupon Skorsky grabbed him roughly by the shoulder and pulled him close as if he wanted to bite his ear. Keep that to yourself, he growled and pushed him away, causing him to stagger a few steps. What's going on? Stephanie wanted to know. Is there a problem? Dominic didn't answer, but looked around worriedly. He was sure that all hell would break loose on them at any moment. Stephanie was certainly smart enough to make sense of it, but kept her opinion to herself. She raised her rifle and peered through the scope at the buildings around her. The street ended in front of one of the entrances to the building, which arched in front of the soldiers as a curved archway with magnificent reliefs. Dominic couldn't tell whether the decorations were part of natural structures or the work of skillful artists. It was difficult to tell whether the tower was a naturally grown plant, used as a palace, or the creation of Akato engineers. After all, the ships of the horseheads were also made of wooden segments. Why should it be any different here? The admiral gave the order to halt and had the soldiers, who had been following them at a good distance, close up. The Gothrex crawled out of the ruins around them into the daylight again and began to crouch down on the ground like dogs waiting for their master to throw a stick. The soldiers marched past and took up position in front of the archway while Zurak and his officers studied a hologram flickering before them. It was not difficult to interpret the symbols swirling around or moving towards the projection. Judging by it, a huge army had deployed around the foundations of the tree and was waiting for the order to enter the building. Dominic was overcome by an uneasy feeling. I hope Zurak isn't planning to go in there, he thought aloud. It's hard to say, said Davis. If he's a brave fool, he won't let the others go ahead and let someone take the butter off his bread. At the admiral's signal, the countless blue dots that lined the base of the holographic tree began to move. Meanwhile, the unit under Zurak's immediate command remained in a waiting position. He doesn't seem to be one of the fools, Davis remarked with relief. A few seconds later, Zurak ordered the Akato soldiers to advance. The huge group of heavily armed warriors strode under the archway and penetrated the darkness beyond. Skorsky couldn't help but praise the admiral. Zurak is definitely no fool. And not a hero either, added Dominic, who was watching the action intently. We should be grateful for that. There are few old fighters among the entourage of brave leaders, Davis said as the last Akato warriors disappeared into the darkness. The echo of their boots could still be heard for a while between the canyons of houses. When it had faded, all that could be heard was the wind blowing over the roofs. The humming of the escort ships, which were making their rounds far away, could be felt more than heard. Dominic looked up and could see some of the small vehicles circling above the branches of the tree, like tiny insects. Some of them drew white contrails on the blue firmament. A larger battleship formed a bizarre silhouette in the sky with its root-like structures. Skorsky couldn't hold back a remark. Zurak is definitely no fool. And no hero either, Dominic added, turning his gaze away from the sky and peering back into the dark entrance. Otherwise he would have gone with his warriors. We should be grateful for that, Davis said as the last Akato warriors disappeared into the darkness. It's rare to find old fighters among the soldiers of brave leaders. 
Stephanie looked at Dominic questioningly. Do you feel anything? He shook his head. No. And that scares me. Davis frowned. And what does that mean? That no one is home, Dominic replied somewhat hastily. And we're just wasting time, or, his conclusion took his breath away, that it's a trap. He had barely completed the sentence when the ground beneath his feet began to shake. Three, four, five thuds ripped through the pavement of the street and sent him reeling. The Gothrex broke free from their stupor and sniffed the air. Some of them hissed and growled. Shortly afterwards, a rumble could be heard coming from inside the tree. A shockwave of dust and debris shot out of the entrance. Dominic and his comrades threw themselves to the ground as they were enveloped in the gray cloud of dust. He hastily dug a filter mask and goggles out of his belt pouch and put them on. From somewhere, Dominic heard the sound of explosions. It sounded far away, like the rumble of thunder, and when the fog lifted, Dominic saw the outline of a huge object hovering in the sky far above him. Recognizable only by the bright surfaces that reflected the sunlight. These shapes made it recognizable as a Kimon ship that had taken up position in orbit above Barathon. All that was left of the Akato battleship that had impressed Dominic only minutes before was swirling debris drifting down from a cloud of smoke. Smaller Akato and Kimon fighter units tore into each other. Hundreds, if not thousands, of combat units shot across the firmament like swarms of angry hornets. A piercing rumbling and crunching sound reached Dominic's ears. As he followed the sound, he saw cracks forming in the trunk of the tree-like building. At one point, roughly in the middle of the trunk, the facade bulged outwards, breaking open and spewing out splinters and fragments that fell thudding to the ground. The entire structure began to lean. The branches swept lazily across the blue sky as the tower tilted. The Kimon ship fired volley after volley at the falling giant. They cut through the artificial branches like machetes. Massive detonations tore holes in the building and caused a rain of debris that buried several houses beneath it. You don't grow old among cowardly army commanders, Dominic said, looking at the dismayed Skorsky. In this case, you may be right, the man murmured incredulously. Zira Odana grabbed the stunned Zurak by the arm and pulled him along. His officers also began to run, away from the falling walls that were about to crush the city beneath them. The Gothrex seemed undecided between instinct and obedience. Between the instinct of self-preservation and the duty to stay close to their master. The whole troop began to run after the admiral decided to flee. Stay together, Davis shouted over the roar of bursting facades and the crash of falling debris. Stay together. Dominic risked a glance upwards and saw the battle unfolding in space around Barathon. More Kimon ships had appeared and an Akato cruiser had just broken in two. The cone-shaped object still dominated the scene, pointing its tip at the city and now sending broadsides into the Akato fleet. The fighter squadrons that had been flying patrols over their heads minutes ago were gone. A single fighter just swooped down burning and disappeared behind the rooftops. At the edge of the city, the ship they had followed to the surface a few hours ago rose up. It was hard-pressed by Kimon fighters and only slowly gained altitude until it finally reached orbit and headed for the Jadaira, which was forced to retreat under fire from enemy battleships. The Jadaira, just a pale, bizarre speck in the sky, slowly disappeared in the haze and behind the clouds piling up on the horizon. Zurak roared. A cry of despair and anger that momentarily drowned out the noise of devastation in which the city was sinking. Dominic realized that they could not hope to be rescued any time soon. A tower collapsed and blocked the road with its remains. The fugitives were forced to dodge into a side alley. Although it was pointless, they continued to run with no particular destination in mind. A deafening rumble and crash could be heard as the tree hit the ground and reduced a large part of the former metropolis to rubble. The hail of splinters and fragments from its branches stopped. After that, it became eerily quiet. Every now and then a detonation could be heard, but that was all. Zira Odana ordered them to stop and form up along the rows of houses. 
Zurak and his officers began to have a heated discussion, during which the admiral grabbed one of them by the throat and threw him to the ground. I'd like to be on the winning side for once, joked Skorsky. It's not much fun anymore. Chapter 13 The Gothrex began to camp around the admiral and his entourage again. Their bodies rose up like a black wall as they watched their surroundings with watchful eyes. Every now and then, one of them lifted its head or reared up on its hind legs to sniff. Dominic saw more of these monsters sneaking out of the ruins. They didn't seem to be part of the group that had accompanied them since their arrival. They greeted each other with mutual sniffing, whereupon the new arrivals joined their conspecifics and enlarged the ring of armored bodies. Dominic estimated the number of monsters at a good 300 by now. That thing is flying away, shouted one of the soldiers, whereupon everyone turned their eyes upwards. The large Kimon ship floated away, but remained at the same height above the surface. The Akata fleet was no longer visible, but several large spaceships of the insectoid creatures followed the mother ship like bees following their queen. Smaller objects descended that looked familiar to Dominic. He had seen similar ships on Chester Station. They were Kimon invasions, or boarding craft, descending between the houses. There would undoubtedly be fighting in the next few hours. The admiral conferred with his officers and studied a holographic map showing part of the city. The focus of their deliberations seemed to be a bunker-like tower rising up from a harbor facility, with jetties and keys reaching far out into the sea. When the briefing was over and the projection was switched off, the order was given to move out. There was a rattling and crunching sound as the Gothrex broke free from their stupor. The scraping of their claws on the stone swelled to a persistent grinding sound, reminiscent of the grinding sound of millstones. As the bizarre army pushed through the alleyways, Dominic had plenty of opportunity to take a closer look at the monsters, one of which was walking right next to him. He wondered why he couldn't feel the presence of the creatures when they were clearly bred from the Kimon sniffers. He reached out and touched the Gothrak on the side. It felt cold, as if it were made of metal. Even now, Dominic felt no connection to the creature, which reminded him more of a machine than a living creature. After a short time, you could hear the sound of the sea on whose coast the city was built. The omnipresent scent of jasmine was replaced by the smell of seaweed and salty air. The impression of approaching the coast was reinforced as they turned into a wide street, at the end of which the blue sky and the sharp horizontal line of the ocean could be seen. The white white caps of the waves shone out on the shimmering green surface of the water. The Akato increased the pace. The Gothrex found it easy to follow the horses' heads, but it was difficult for the humans not to lose touch. The Akato and Gothrex had already reached the end of the road, while Dominic and his companions were still moving in the shadows of the ravine. You should always stay close to Zurak, Dominic remembered the Serwin's order. Apparently, the Admiral's priorities had just changed. In any case, the protection offered by the Gothrex seemed to be enough for him at the moment. Take the safety off. Davis ordered. Stand by. The Snowcats complied with the order almost instinctively. By now they had accepted Davis as their leader. Some of the tunnel rats followed her example and took the safety off their guns. Get ready for battle. Longhill also continued to act as chief of his squad. Secure the rear. The last Gothrex had just passed when a group of Kimon warriors came out of a side alley. There were about ten grotesque figures in gleaming silver armor, their rifles at the ready. Stephanie was the first to fire her weapon and received the enemies with a well-aimed volley. She hit one of the Kimon in the head, causing him to topple over like a lifeless statue. Another shot shattered a rifle, which exploded in the Kimon's hands. Dominic also scored a hit, knocking a Kimon to the ground. A hail of bullets rained down on the armored warriors, killing them one by one. After a few seconds, the enemies were destroyed. Don't mess with us, shouted a soldier, punching one last shot into the pile of felled bodies as if to sign his work of art. They'll think twice about taking us on, Stephanie gasped, rushing alongside Dominic towards the sea. They will have adjusted to us quickly, Dominic replied. Give your head a break, Stephanie replied. 
We've just punched them in the face. We'll get our revenge soon enough. They reached a quay that lined the edge of the town and ran out into many jetties that reached far into the sea. Here and there, the remains of ships protruded from the water, washed by foaming surf. The Gothrax had almost all disappeared. Dominic could just see some of them climbing into open windows and doors or slipping into the narrow alleyways. Apparently, they had orders to secure the area around the bunker at the entrance to which the Akato were clustered. The building towered four or five stories high and secured the entrance to the harbor area. Similar structures were lined up along the artificial coast, aiming their guns at imaginary enemies on the horizon or in the sky that arched cloudlessly over the sea. Far out on the ocean, the outlines of another fortress could be seen, its massive form rising out of the water like a gnarled tree stump. Surely it too had been abandoned, for no defensive fire had emanated from it when the Kimon launched their attack. It also seemed largely unharmed and had apparently escaped the bombardment of the insectoid creatures so far. The guardsmen had just caught up with the Akato, who were trying to open the entrance to the bunker when the door slid aside. A soft whirring could be heard, indicating that the bunker still had power. At least for some areas. Dominic doubted that it was enough to make the bunker combat ready or to enable it to repel an attack. The corridor they entered was dark and the air inside smelled foul, like stale seawater and algae. Condensation dripped from the ceiling. The floor was littered with puddles. Like everything the Akato built, this building was made of some kind of wood. This type was as black as pitch and shone like lacquer. It was hard to say whether it was due to the humidity or a characteristic of this type of wood. After all the soldiers had stepped into the corridor, the door closed and for a moment the whole troop found itself shrouded in darkness. The Akato took flashlights out of their belt pouches and shone them into the blackness. Zira seemed to know exactly where their destination was and hurried ahead of the troop into the darkness. Dominic stumbled more than once as they hurried through the vaults. The brackish water from the puddles splashed up and spread a disgusting stench that almost robbed him of his senses. Dominic couldn't tell how long they hurried through the corridors of the bunker, but it seemed like hours. Hours in which they ran past dark tunnels and yawning shafts that were more to be guessed at than seen in the gloom until they finally reached their destination. It was a wide hall with a huge basin filled with seawater. Dull daylight seeped through the surface of the pool, which seemed somehow connected to the sea. Dominic recognized a lot of objects sticking half-submerged out of the water or anchored along the basin. They reminded him of submarines, with bulging superstructures. Like the other Akato ships, they also looked like driftwood. Tree trunks sanded smooth by wind and waves. Zira Odana took a pen-like device out of her belt and aimed it at the submarines one after the other until a light shone on one of them. A spotlight. From a high bulge, which was obviously the conning tower, it illuminated the forecastle. Where the bulge merged into the forecastle, a hatch opened, from which a greenish glimmer of light fell outside. A piercing sound, loud and deep, like a horn signal, filled the hall and faded away. Apparently the boat was ready for action and had welcomed its new crew. The Admiral and Zira Odana crossed from the quay to the submarine via a footbridge that extended from the bow of the boat onto the quay and stepped inside through the hatch. The soldiers followed them. Dominic immediately noticed the pleasant smell and the refreshing coolness on board the boat, which appeared to be completely undamaged. The troops reached the command post, which bore a striking resemblance to that of a submarine as designed by humans apart from the sinuous shapes, of course. The consoles were arranged on the walls around a periscope, complete with command chair. Zira Odana thought it appropriate to address the people. This is the Jitta. A diving ship. We're going to use it to get to an island where there's a base, she explained. It's remote and could possibly have escaped the Kimon. From there, we might be able to send a distress signal undetected. There were decidedly too many imponderables in the Akato woman's explanations. Could. Perhaps. Possibly. Words that gave Dominic little hope. He felt more abandoned right now than he had on Dostra, across whose surface they had wandered. 
a forced march of hundreds of kilometers, dragging a shipwreck behind them and still managing to survive. It felt good to have their fate in their own hands, even if the prospects were poor. Now it felt different. And why aren't we doing that now? asked an older soldier. Surely the ship has a transmitter? It's not a spaceship, Akato objected. The transmission power is limited to the planet and tuned to underwater communication. The soldier didn't let up. I'm a radio engineer. Maybe I can get the transmitter up to speed. Dominic doubted that the horseheads would let him get his hands on this fillet of Akato Technic. We'll come back to your suggestion, Zira Odana replied. But first we won't send a signal. It's too risky as long as we have to assume that the enemy is still nearby. That was the end of the information session and the Akato put their heads together again to confer with each other. Shortly afterwards, the group dispersed. Each of them obviously knew what they had to do and each occupied a console in the command post. The engines started up and the boat began to rock. Then a jolt went through the jitta, throwing the people to the ground and against the sides. Zurak Mestre began to curse and insult one of the officers, who had obviously not disconnected the chains holding the boat to the quay. Great, the old soldier muttered so that everyone could hear him. They don't need bugs to kill us all. Shut up, Hunt, growled Longhill. By your command, the engineer replied, but it didn't sound respectful. You have nothing to order me to do, was the real meaning of his words, and Dominic realized that the balance of power in the squad would soon have to be reshuffled to avoid a dangerous vacuum. Davis and Skorsky had already made up ground in the squad's reputation. At the moment, Roderick Miles was the Akata's point of contact when it came to passing on orders and instructions to the guard sites, ignoring Longhill. But Miles didn't seem comfortable in his role. He was an instructor, but not a leader. Dominic wondered what role the Akato played in this and whether they secretly favored or even wanted such a power struggle. It would at least be in keeping with their archaic culture. The jitter rocked back and forth for a while, testifying to the officer's inability to steer a watercraft properly. There were certainly similarities between piloting a spaceship and a submarine, but at the moment it looked as if they would not be able to get the jitta out of the sea base. Zira Odana seemed the most capable of all and quickly took command. She barked orders with energetic words and shooed the officers around the room. Her efforts were soon crowned with success, as after a few maneuvers within the basin, the horseheads managed to make a few loops without hitting an obstacle. At some point, they ventured out of the bunker and Dominic felt the boat dip below the surface at a shallow angle. He held his breath as the engines hummed and could feel the tension of his comrades sitting silently on the ground next to him. They stared into space with anxious looks, waiting for a collision. Dominic was expecting it too, but the collision had yet to happen. He began to count the seconds. They had already been submerged for a minute. Two minutes. Three. Something scraped along the hull. The wood of the jitta creaked and groaned. Then there was another blow that made everyone flinch. Suddenly, the hum of the engines increased to a bright whine. You could clearly feel the jitta picking up speed. The minutes passed while the drive continued to run without any problems and the Akato began to relax. Zurak stomped proudly through the bridge and glanced at the monitors, which shimmered in green light. Zira Odana stood in front of the guardsmen for a moment, as if she needed to check their numbers, then turned away and turned her attention to the displays on her console. Dominic decided to have a look around the ship, crossed the bridge and walked along the central corridor of the boat. At one point, the corridor widened and finally led into a large chamber in which two armored gun ports curved outwards. In front of each were two machines, which were either cannons or torpedo launchers. The hatches on the wall, in which he suspected the explosive devices, spoke in favor of the latter. Sunlight filtered in through two narrow slits in the armored bulkheads. The jitta was obviously moving just below the surface. Reckless, Dominic thought, but apparently the skills and courage of the space travelers were not sufficient to go to depth. If the Kimon were watching the sea, they would soon notice the ship. 
You're very curious, Dominic heard Zira say, leaning against the wall at the entrance to the chamber. I didn't want to. You don't have to apologize, Akato beat him to it. That's me too. I have to stick my nose into everything. I can be very stubborn. Some people think I'm downright impertinent. But I always get my answers. Somehow her words sounded threatening, but Dominic tried to smile and not let his irritation show. You are an interesting group of soft-skinned people, Zira Odana continued. Resourceful and unstoppable. Word of your adventure on Dostra has spread and impressed many. We've lost a lot of soldiers, Dominic objected. The losses have reduced our troops to a small group. Survival is everything, the dead are quickly forgotten. She detached herself from the wall and approached Dominic. He had to look up at her when she spoke to him again. I have heard, she said in a conspiratorial tone, that exciting events had already occurred before your remarkable hike. There is said to be a. She narrowed her eyes and searched for the right word, a shikaka, a clear-sighted one. Did she know who it was, Dominic wondered, or was she just taking a shot in the dark? He tried to buy time. Shichaka? The word sounded interesting. Did you translate that literally? Zira smiled wryly, as if to pay her respects to Dominic. Dominic's sisters were of the opinion that you could read him like a book. But at the moment, he had decided to prove himself a tough nut to crack. The fact that he was still alive after all that had happened reinforced his belief that he was in fact a tough guy. His sisters would be surprised if they knew how clever he had been over the last few months. Or had it just been luck? His brother would certainly prefer that option to admitting that his younger brother was a smart guy. Whatever the case, Dominic had the feeling that it was more than necessary not to let Zira break him. She was up to something. After looking at Dominic for long enough, Zira found her words again. In reality, it describes someone who stands on a mountain and can see into the distance. Dominic looked for a movement on Akato's face. In the sunshine, I suppose. If he thought he had upset her with this remark, he was mistaken. In sunshine, Zira repeated, looking down at him in a mixture of recognition and suppressed anger. I bet you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dominic tilted his head. I don't know what clear-sighted means exactly. Oh yes, you do. Zira's voice was cutting and cold. The low growl that punctuated her every word, as was customary with the Akato, tickled the pit of his stomach. It wasn't easy to get information out of your comrades. You humans stick together. Loyalty is something we Akato also value. Dominic was tempted to shake his head, but he decided to let Zira believe that. She thought too highly of people. Loyalty was now a discontinued commodity. Useful when needed, easily discarded when it became inconvenient. The inhabitants of the soul system had lost their humanity with the Akato and Kimon invasion. Soldiers stick their asses out for each other, Dominic replied casually. For a brief moment, he thought he recognized an expression of irritation in Zira's expression. A good moment that encouraged him in his course. He felt equal to the Akato woman. That means, he continued hurriedly, that we are there for each other. As he said this, Dominic had to revise his previous thoughts. The lack of loyalty thing was only partly true. It might apply to civilians, but not to soldiers at least not to any great extent. He found himself reflecting on his father, who did not have a very high opinion of civilians. He was convinced that the conditions in a civilization resembled a war of attrition in which people became cannibals. Ready to commit any crime imaginable. Of course, it was the same in war, only the insidiousness, as Dominic's father said, was of a completely different quality among civilians and was also directed against friends. In this respect, Dominic wasn't really surprised that his comrades had kept their mouths shut and said nothing about his abilities. Even though they hadn't always been well disposed towards him when he thought back to his first days with the tunnel rats. 
And actually, those first days weren't over yet. Only a few weeks had passed since his arrival on Dostra. Too little time for real friendships, but apparently enough for a solid camaraderie. When I meet the clear-sighted one, Dominic said succinctly, I'll tell him that you want to see him. Zira reached out and took Dominic's face between her fingers. She gently stroked his cheekbones with her thumb and forefinger. How fragile you are, she said with an underlying threat. And yet you have abilities that are not ours and that we need very much. I'm not telling you anything new. Someone who can sense the Kimon when they are still far away represents an opportunity that can ensure the survival of our kind. We Akato don't have these abilities. Not even to begin with. A joke of nature. Perhaps a test of Otane. I can't say, but I'll do everything I can to laugh at the joke in the end. I want to walk out of the trial successfully so I can ask Otane my questions when I stand before his throne in the Great Hall. Was Dominic to conclude from her words that the Akato were completely desperate and feared for their existence as a people? Were they fighting a rearguard action against hordes of victorious Kimon? I don't want to make a fool of myself, Zira continued. Everything I've heard about the Shikaka is still rumor. Fueled by your remarkable fight for survival. People are quick to forget the facts and prove themselves to be storytellers and poets. Dominic involuntarily wondered what the Akato had done to their human soldiers in order to discover the secrets of their special minds. On the hospital ship Nugo, it would have been easy to drug them all and get the information out of them. But apparently that hadn't happened. Did he have Tian Goa to thank for that? The doctor who treated him and his comrades. He had made some strange suggestions. A joke, he claimed. A poorly placed punchline about dark secrets that had remained untouched in people's minds. A remark about Ulan Mestre, who was supposedly a philanthropist with a real quirk and who maintained the hospital ship. At least enough information to tell Dominic that the Akato around Zurak Mestre hadn't found out too much about him and the tunnel rats. Apart from the details that were already known and had been embellished into a fairy tale. Zira still held Dominic's head in her hands, as if she hoped to get to the secrets that lay dormant inside. Her wide eyes searched his face until she gave a snide grunt and left. Dominic followed Zira as she hurried through the corridor with long strides and roughly pushed Stephanie aside, who had obviously decided to follow her friend. What's wrong with her? The young woman asked, rubbing her aching shoulder. Without the armor, I'd have a broken arm. You didn't spurn her courtship, did you? Dominic couldn't help but recognize a certain truth in the remark. It always depends on what the object of desire possesses. Something you want because you need it. It's not beauty with you, said Stephanie. At least your joke is better than Dr. Goa's. Stephanie frowned. What kind of conversation have you been having here? If I had to paraphrase, it was about values. And if you didn't have to rewrite it. About theft and rape. Stephanie swallowed. What did she want? Me. But she doesn't know that yet. She's interested in the ability I have, but she hasn't yet found out who among us has the special sense. So far, everyone has kept quiet. And on the Nugo, they've also prevented anyone from looking inside our heads to see who the prodigy is. Stephanie glanced furtively down the corridor. Do you think they want to dissect us? I think anything is possible at the moment. Chapter 14 Dominic lost all sense of time as the Jitta chased towards its destination just below the surface of the water. After an eternity, which he and his companions had spent in a dull, brooding silence, the boat began to rise again and lose speed. A hatch opened above their heads, like a crack splitting open. Sunlight flooded in and with it a breeze of fresh, salty sea air. Rung slid out of the walls so that the soldiers could climb up. Dominic was the first to take the opportunity and climb out of the boat. He found himself on the foredeck, surrounded by the foaming spray, large waves crashing against the hull. Splashing water coolly wetted his face and the wind roared in his ears. 
The late afternoon sun was already turning the sky golden and the sea shimmered a dark blue-green, making the white white caps of the moving sea glow. Directly ahead, the contours of a small island emerged from the ocean. Only a small quay indicated that it was more than a simple, uninhabited island. A rugged rock, framed by palm-like trees, dominated the picture. One by one, the soldiers climbed onto the deck, visibly enjoying the fresh sea air after hours of breathing stale, filtered air. Stephanie looked at the destination suspiciously. A few weeks relaxing in the South Seas. I wouldn't mind that, but I don't think we'll get it. Dominic could now see numerous openings in the rock faces. As was to be expected, the Akato had hollowed out the small mountain and turned it into a fortress. A few days of sun and sea. I could get used to that. But I can imagine that the horseheads have enough work for us to make us forget about paradise. Zira climbed onto the deck and made her way through the guardsmen to the bow of the boat. She took a close look at the shore before turning to the people with an order. Prepare for battle. The soldiers checked their rifles and put on their helmets. Here and there a magazine was replaced as the Jitta headed for the quay. A dark shadow loomed beneath a rocky outcrop. A depression whose edges were too regular to be of natural origin. From there, the quay extended a few hundred meters into the sea. Its end ended in a low tower, against which the waves broke thunderously. Cannons, with blue-green plants growing from their muzzles, aimed at invisible enemies. Seaweed hung down from their barrels into the sea like long, gray-brown manies. It would be a good idea to slow down now, Dominic thought as they passed the height of the tower. The bow wave of the jitter reached the quay wall and washed over it. Unease spread among the guardsmen, who had similar thoughts to Dominic. There was no railing or anything like that to hold on to in the event of a collision with the harbor wall. At this speed, however, it wouldn't matter anyway. The first few crouched down on the ground, but Dominic didn't want to get carried away just yet. Davis, Skorsky and Stephanie were also prepared not to show any weakness in the eyes of the Akato woman and resisted the pressure to throw themselves to the ground. Longhill and his officers did the same as the snowcats and also remained motionless like figureheads. The dark mob beneath the rocky outcrop was now yawning like the mouth of a sea monster. Inside the port facility, Dominic could make out decks, floors and entrances that led further into the mountain. Unlike the station they had left, there were no wrecks bobbing in the water here. Now it really was time to slow down. The urge to get to safety somehow, even if it was simply by jumping off the boat, became more and more irresistible. Just as Dominic thought the most sensible thing to do was to make a courageous leap from the deck into the water, the braking process began. The Jitta's engines, whatever they were, howled like an old car in reverse. The soldiers were unable to resist gravity and tumbled across the deck towards the bow. The top of the boat tilted and a breaker washed back the people who had almost gone overboard. A bang sounded from somewhere and smoke rose from the stern. A cloud of smoke rolled over the jitta. An acrid stench spread and the ship continued to lose speed. Finally, the engine failed. The hum of the propulsion module faded and the jitta drifted rudderless into the harbor basin under the rock, but still had enough speed to crash into the jetties and mooring platforms inside the basin. With a deafening crunch, the boat bore into the harbor, bending cranes, mooring grabs and other devices for mooring ships. It crushed a pontoon bridge that was floating on the water and slightly cushioned the impact against the quay wall. As if he had been kicked in the back, Dominic went overboard in a high arc. He plunged deep into the warm water of the harbor basin and hit his chest against an iron railing. The blow knocked the air out of his lungs. Dominic kicked and rode with his arms to get back to the surface. He kept bumping into metal parts. Bent beams, struts and knotted steel cables that had pulled the boat under its hull and were clutching it like steel vines. Panicked, Dominic tried to work his way back to the surface as more bodies plunged into the water. He heard muffled thuds, accompanied by the hissing and bubbling of the salt water. Here and there, someone crashed into a piece of debris. He didn't dare imagine how many of his comrades had just been injured or killed. 
He looked up at the glittering waves, on which the light of the afternoon sun danced as it slanted into the cave. Dominic's strength failed and his vision blurred. In front of his face, a shadowy pattern danced from the bright fragments of sunlight mixed with the blue-green shadows of the watery depths. The air in his lungs was no longer enough to supply his blood and muscles with oxygen. Every movement became agonizing and sucked even more energy from his body. The urge to catch his breath became irresistible. It was impossible to control himself. He opened his mouth and felt the water flowing into his mouth. For a moment, his lungs resisted taking in this foreign substance, but it was easier the second time. Dominic's resistance faded. His eyes went black and all the sounds around him sank into the depths with him.